Welcome everybody to season five, series five. Season yeah. five? Mm. Series five. Series five. Mm. Series five. Fifth season, series. Season American. Se uh, yeah, series, definitely. Yeah. Series and five. It, and it makes it sound more glamorous than what it is. A season is... Well, uh, don't put us down too much. I, I'm amazed mm. we've been going well, five seasons. There's enough people doing that for us. Well. <laughs> Particularly you, actually. Let's not do it ourselves. Well, I mean, I wasn't going to do that at all this, this series, oh. this season. All positive vibes this year. <laughs> to right? be fair, this, the season hasn't started. The, the actual sporting season hasn't started. So let's wait and see... Yeah, it's a long time. It? <laughs> long time. You can take it. I've missed you, Will. I've missed you. Well, I say I've missed you. I mean, it probably shows who I'm more friends with because I've seen Mark since the season ended, mm. probably weekly, and, and this is the first time I've seen you well, since the last episode. Well, you say that. We used to have an interesting discussion of when you played in teams with lads, as whether you're friends or colleagues. Mm. And how would you describe our... Well, you can just be colleagues, can't you? You'd, yeah. have, to be, you'd have to be all friends with everybody. Is that what we are? We're colleagues, yeah. yeah. <laughs> With benefits. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, look, to be fair, season five, Mark, um, we were just looking back when we were flicking down because mm. we did a season called Whippets and Flat Caps in a basement in Dungeon. Shorten. Probably more Dungeon. Dungeon, it was, Dun yeah. yeah. On reflection, that was really weird. Yeah, but hold on. Do you, know, do you know who we had on the first ever episode? The first ever episode of Whips and Flaggers, we got Eddie Hearn on. Eddie Hearn. That's not a bad first James, guest. Jamie Peacock. It's gone downhill from there. I was going to say, it's gone down. <laughs> it's gone tits up. Here we are now. <laughs> it's gone tits up. But we go again. And Mark, you're here, amazingly. Mm, you're yeah. here again. How I'm still sticking around is, uh, yeah, it's amazing. Because your, your words per pound yeah, it's, yeah. is it's it's astonishing. Very, very limited. It? And what I do say is not the best either. <laughs> very so, limited. Um, yeah, thanks for letting me stick around. Thanks. Very yeah, I we didn't have much say in it, really, did we? We, um, well, yeah, there was what there was that one season where they said they want to get if rid you of you. Keep turning up, you just keep getting paired. And Genuinely, there was one se summer where they went yeah. winter, even like like, do you need Mark? And I was like, well, he was there from the Who beginning. Who would you replace Mark with? Is a good question. Um, like a brick wall, like a um, what an inanimate object. Kyle Amor. Kyle Amor. That's cruel. <laughs> Why? I was thinking just more comical, but <laughs> no, because it was it was genuinely right. discussed. Yeah. It was it was discussed at a meeting. Got tossed up. Uh, so they, they said like Kyle will do it if we get rid of Mark, and I was like, well, no, I'd quite like to keep Mark, and then that was it. Yeah. But, um, but anyway, that's awkward, isn't it? We shouldn't really say that on air. No. And the guests keep coming. The big big guests keep coming this massive. season. They do. And massive. This is a fella who was very near the top of our list, considering he's one of your best friends, John. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it's taken us. Five years, six seasons. Uh, professional and respect, really. Is that what it for is? Paul, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, there we go. Let's bring him in. The new Saints coach, Mr. St. Helens, Paul Wellens. Clap. Yeah. Everyone clap in the background. Yeah. That's thousands. Thousands. We're doing of it in front of a live audience <laughs> in, in Hull again. <laughs> I wonder if we'll go back to Hull. No. Paul, lovely to see you. Yeah, um, you You've had so many serious questions since you got the job, and I w actually watched your 43 minute. First press conference as Saints head coach. 43 minutes. Yeah, it's quite wow. a lot. Like five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Just hand the mic to Paul. Yes. There you go, 43 but I, minutes. But I wanted to ask the, the big questions, and I wanted to know what your favourite cheese was. Oh, well, I don't know what it's actually called, but you know, like, it's like a spicy orange one. I don't know. That's Mexican one. cheddar. It's, it's, like one that, it's one that my wife loves. So What's like a platter? I don't know. It's orange colour. It's spicy. spicy orange. What has it got? You ask for that in restaurants. Kind of got, spicy. Yeah. Has it got a spicy flicker of red throughout it? Yeah, like yeah, little yeah. speckles. So it's like a chilli. Yeah, like a chilli. A chilli infused yeah. cheddar. Yes. Or that. red Leicester yeah, or red something. Sounds like a Marks and Spencer's number. Yeah. It does. Mm. Yeah. I don't. Not think very Saint ever, Helens. That is it. I don't think you should ever do that with cheese. That's my personal opinion. No. Spiced cheese. I like a wedge of Edam. A wedge of Edam. I know you don't. Nobody likes I brought Edam. One, Jim and I brought it around to your house for a cheese board. <laughs> That's a good a cheese one. board at John's I house. Flash, bring some cheese and he brought a, he brought a wedge of Edam. <laughs> <laughs> like he'd never been to a house party or he'd never been to dinner. That's what John does at his house party. just gets uh, cheese, cheese strings. Cheese boards out. <laughs> cheese strings. John will tell you I was never ever like a, a, a cheese board stroll. Like one what? Ever in my well, life. well, 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 hang on a minute. Hang on. Because we need to talk about this. Like, well, a man of simple taste right mm. i know him very well and and he was resistant to the appeal of wine drinking actually wine culture for a long time why why paul what did he used to say wine was for I, i'm not I'll it began with a d and ended in x <laughs> <laughs> it was but, just something that you know i just never, was never really into that to the age of 37, 38, I never drank coffee and I never drank wine. <laughs> Shows how little you know yeah. about life. Why, it? Paul? What, what, why? What I don't reason? know. Like, I think like John said, I was just a very, had a very simple view on life. So <laughs> I was always a tea drinker. Uh, 
like religiously growing up. And my dad always said, you like you sip wine, you, know, you drink beer, and you don't. Uh, you sorry, you sip wine, you quaff beer, but you don't drink spirits. So I kind of stuck to that rule for a while without <laughs> sipping the wine. But hold on. Uh, uh, so a little birdie now tells me you have a wine fridge. Yeah, I do have a wine fridge. Yeah. How so times have changed? Yeah, What's so in the wine, wine fridge, fridge, Paul? What's well, your tipple? Well, because I'm quite new on the wine scene, it's uh, more of a New Zealand Sauvignon Marlboro. Very nice. Mm. Oh, very that's, nice. My, that's my go-to. So There's one actually a specific one called Squealing Pig, which I like. Squealing <laughs> Pig. <laughs> Great name. Sounds like a Was there a specific yeah. moment where you suddenly got turned? Uh, we're still talking about the wine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, just it's more down to uh, uh, my wife, really. She she likes it, doesn't mind the tipple, and just sat on the sofa after it finished playing. And, uh, you know, when you might have a, you know, the odd little glass just watching a movie or something, and you should just try one, just try one. So <laughs> the I odd did. little glass. Uh, uh, the odd little glass. Which turns into a bottle. Uh, and now you drink it every and, night. Uh, but yeah. why wine? <laughs> Why they make wine in a 750 ml bottle? And I think that's smart because it's never enough, is it? One no. bottle. Leaves you wanting more. Between two or Between three. Between two, yeah, it's never maybe, enough. Maybe you just need another, then you open another bottle, don't you? Mm. It's a trap of wine. You and Fran like wine, don't you? Uh, <laughs> can I shock you, Will? Go At on. any one time, we have nine bottles of wine in our house. <laughs> it's partridge, sorry. All right, sorry. sorry. So is what's your favourite cheese? Yeah, but it was. Yeah, there we go. Smelly, <laughs> it's got walnuts in. <laughs> Uh, so Paul Wellens likes wine revelation yes do you know what he doesn't like Paul Wellens is Star Wars and for a man who was born in 1980 that I thought is you were going to say St. Helens <laughs> well, well for a man who's in, <laughs> born in St. Helens he doesn't no, like but anyone born in 1980 should like Star Wars quite fiercely yeah no I've just never been into those types of movies that just don't they're just made up, aren't they? You what know? do you mean? Every movie's made up, Paul. <laughs> yeah, no. In but, essence. Like Stormtroopers and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not having Lord of the Rings, not no, having no. any Game of, of Thrones. I've never watched Harry Potter. Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones is the one exception. Oh! Yeah. No. So he doesn't like make believe, but likes dragons and. Yeah, yeah. All like, sorts. I can't do stormtroopers, but flying dragons are more fun. <laughs> That's within the realms of possibility of flying dragon. Oh my what god! What's your favourite film? Well, Forrest Gump. Dumb and Dumber. This is not your favourite ever is. film. Paul makes me no. happy. Oh. Dumb and Dumber is your favourite film yeah. of can't all time. Be, that can't be That's true. That's pathetic. Oh, good fellas. <laughs> <laughs> just, for, just to get my man points back up go on Paul well m more recently it's probably like a, like a step brothers type thing that's an easy watch good, film. good humour but favourite ever like one that you take to a desert island with you wouldn't be cast away would it it probably oh, would be actually yeah. <laughs> yeah. Been Bear, Bear have you been guys. to the castaway you've been island. to the castaway island with yeah. Wilson yeah uh, I've been on a holiday for four weeks and I climbed a, a palm tree on the island and, and my wife took a picture of me and it's pff, it's not good <laughs> It's not good for <laughs> Melted you. Melted candle. Kench. There's a full Kench hanging over the post for me. In my mind, I thought, you know, look, this is like sort of... Melted candle. Cool. Yeah, but it wasn't. Melted candle. It was a car crash. Yeah. Look, we, we do have more serious questions for you, Paul. We'd sort of ease you in here. And like, and we, we, I often put out a little sort of tweet and say, look, we've got so-and-so coming on the podcast. Sometimes Mark hacks the Twitter and puts things Sometimes, on there. Yeah. Um, and the sort of slightly less serious questions we got back. Uh, one, for, well, one from Bert Bridge on the subject of drinking wine. Bert, Bert, Bridge. Bert, Bert Bridge. Bridge. Bert Bridge. What a name. Um, says, the best pub in St. Helens? Question mark. Oh, I'm going to have to be careful what I say here because there's a few local establishments. Oh, so Paul be, spreads himself thin. Mm. I'd be, I'd be thinking, oh. Oh. Well, Speak from the heart, Paul. Come on. Well, th there's two that spring to mind for me. What were the, the, no, that's the, the best. They can't be equally well, best. The, the local... Uh, my local, the one that closest to me, is a pub called the Griffin Inn now. Great yeah, pub. Great, you've you've great been pub. there yourselves, yeah. So is that only your favourite because it's close? Yeah, because it's very close, and it's where we celebrated the grand final win in 2014. Oh, I remember, remember that from, flush, yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hold some happy memories. And then there's a social club across the road from where my mum and dad, uh, where I grew up with my mum and dad, called Greenall Social Club. And John, been you, been, you've, both, you've both been to the... Social the club. I've never been in the social club. It's not the most glamorous of places, but uh, yeah. it's... It's if those walls could talk. Yes, if, if the walls so, could so talk. We so which one's the favourite? I know, but what we've worked <laughs> out with Paul is, <laughs> if it's within walking distance from where <laughs> yeah. he lives, it's going to get peppered. <laughs> Pretty <laughs> much, yeah. DJ Neil Scotland, Paul, has got this question for you. How many chickens would it take to kill an elephant? Oof. It's like death by a thousand cuts in it, so I'd say a thousand. Real, I realistically, I'm in chicken. Great, well, I'm <laughs> in thousands. I'm saying that what they've got to do <laughs> is get organised, which is hard. Chicken's yeah. historically not that organised. 
and they've no. just got to get pecking, haven't they? It's not going to take a thousand, is it? They kept you know, fifteen, of them. It, it fifteen would. consistently pecking. It's elephant just be crumbling. Fifteen's not enough. Anyway, the questions get out there. We, we'll yeah. try and answer them for you. Thank you to <laughs> DJ Neil Scotland. Not a real DJ, <laughs> is it? I don't know. Maybe he is. Um, Paul, young Paul, young Paul Wellens. Mm. What did mm. young Paul Wellens Paul look Simon like? Paul Simon Wellens. Paul, mm. is that true? Because John of, often mm. gives me bits of Paul information Simon. which don't tend to be yeah. true. And your name. So is it Paul Simon, like Paul? Like the, no, the guy from Paul, Art and Paul Garfunkel. Simon's my middle name, so it's not like a oh. it's not like a double barrel, but yeah, it's Paul, Simon's my middle name. Big so. disciple vibes there, aren't there? Mm. Yeah, religious, is, yeah, very religious. Roman Catholic very family. Roman Catholic, well, yeah. You went to a Roman went Catholic to school. Every Sunday was part of a, a Catholic choir. Did all that type of thing. Honestly, mm. yeah, yeah. He's got choir boy looks, hasn't he? Mm. Uh, I couldn't sing. Uh, I used to sit, uh, sit on the back row twiddling my tassels. <laughs> So you were quite were you head head choir boy? No, 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 no. no. Altar boy? Do you follow? follow no, I never did that. No. Just uh, as part of a parish choir uh, th through the school, sung at church every Sunday morning. Uh, didn't have, didn't actually join like a junior rugby team up until the age of eleven when I left the choir because you know my mum was so adamant that you know I continued. So it was a massive church. part of the family life, wasn't it? Well, it was growing up. Yeah, I mean, me, me brothers are uh, like kind of 20, well, they won't find me saying it, but my elder brother's like, like 20 years older than me, and one of them's 14 years older than me, and they were part of the parish choir, but at, at the time when it was kind of in, in its pomp, yeah. it was, uh, <laughs> they'd be going off on choir holidays, through camping through Europe and all that type of thing, that's what they did back then, uh, but obviously when I, I got there, it was kind of coming towards an end. Yeah, and just, just sort of going back, you just sort of just casually just flicked over something there, so your brothers are how much older than you? So, Kevin's... 20 years, uh, Ian, uh, Brian's 19 years, Ian's 14 years. So you've got a 60-year-old brother? Uh, I've got what, sorry? A 60-year-old 60 60 brother. 60-year-old brother, yeah, wow. Six, 62. Right, mm. and you are a twin? And I've got a sister who's older than them, who's 63. And you're, you, but you are a twin? a twin sister. Identical yeah. twin. So just doing yeah. the maths here, right, you've got to get into the, the Wellens family household. So your mum and dad <clears> are 50-ish. My, my dad was 49 and my mum was 43 when we were born, yeah. me and my twin sister. So you had 20-year-old kids and then mm. a long comes yeah, twin. Long wow. Def <laughs> definitely planned. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you weren't an accident, were you? Yeah. Could you imagine yeah. that conversation? You'd just, just love to be there. We, ju we just never even had to have that conversation. It was just quite obvious. Yeah. <laughs> quite obvious. And then once I had kids of my own, I thought, well, yeah, we definitely weren't planned. No. <laughs> <laughs> So do you, have, do you have weird twin vibes? You know what your sister's doing the whole time? No, not really. No, we, we, we are very close. Uh, you know, like, I suppose like any brother and sister growing up together, we, we argued a fair bit at times, but we've always kind of had each other's back. Was it good having older siblings like that? Or was yeah, it straight? It was like, strange. Because that's such a big gap, isn't it? Yeah, mm. because uh, um, Ian was still at home when, when I was growing up, but uh, you know, Brian, Les and Kevin, they'd kind of got, got partners of their own and kids and you can tell of, how old it is you say Ian on. no one no one's called it's Ian in the last yeah. 40 years no, eh? no, if someone's no. born imagine having a son now called Ian doesn't happen does yeah, it not many is there not many no. Ian's or Brian's or Kevin's to be, to, <laughs> to be <laughs> fair but it was a trio <laughs> yeah. unpopular yeah. very unpopular yeah. Pauls? <laughs> Pauls not many Pauls knocking about no. Pauls no. Mine, but tight family tight family unit growing up even though even the age gap yeah definitely I mean, we've always been like so kind of my mum where she lives on Alder Road in St Helens it's always been kind of a bit of a revolving door uh, you know, John will tell you that from when he's been down there himself. There's always people there, so a very close knit family. Uh, obviously, brothers and sisters have had children of their own, so there's uh, so many cousins knocking around as well. So <laughs> yeah, there's always something going on. And your dad, I think I'm right in saying, worked for Saints for for 30 years as a as a scout. So yeah. before you started playing rugby, take us on this journey of how. You, you saw your dad around the club and how you got that first smell of Saints. Yeah, well, I think it's, it think because of my dad's connection with the club, like he would go up there and watch training sessions and junior sessions and different things like that. And I would almost just tag along at times. And so, you know, sometimes after games, my dad would end up getting access into the change rooms and I'd go along with him and you'd kind of I'd walk into the Saints dressing room and there'd be Kevin Ward and Paul Lachlan and Shane Cooper and I'd just be like a... Like a 11, 12 year old kid, uh, just looking at kind of what were your heroes at the time, but mm. probably getting access that uh, that not every kid in, in St. Helens got at that time, but being in and around the place so much probably gave me a, that little bit of a, an extra thirst for, for, the, for the town and the team really. And like I've, I've always been a huge Saints fan all my life and I think a lot of that comes from my dad and his involvement at the club as well. Where did your rugby journey begin then in terms of being, you, you mentioned there being 11 and going into the dressing room. You're obviously playing at 
kids' level at that stage, right? School. Yeah, well, I first started playing just through school rugby, actually. I had a, a headmaster at the time at, at St. Jesus School where I went called Brian Higgins. He's, he's no longer with us, but he, he was quite influential on me and, and getting me playing at the start. And, uh, and, and then, obviously, after leaving the choir, it was a tough decision. Uh, uh, I started uh, the choir. <laughs> Do you still speak to some of your choir mates? Yeah, we had some of them are like kind of my best mates because we went to school together, played school rugby together, and, and obviously we're in the choir. So, lads, we're going to have to ditch the choir. Yeah. The Saints have offered us a like, contract. Is that when Robbie Williams left there? That <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was an emotional day. You know, when he actually left the choir, what night it was? Uh, he, he, remember he, the night? He, no, no, he, he, he put choir practice on on uh, uh, the same night England played Germany in the World Cup semi final, Italy United. Oh, wow. So, I mean, that was the Chris straw. Chris Waddle, that, <laughs> that was the straw that broke the camera. The choir wow. master yeah. was like, we've got a schedule clash here. Yeah. yeah. It's like so, Chris Waddle over the bar. Yeah, that, night. That, that, that night, yeah. So, that was a, not only a disastrous night for. Uh, English for football, choir. but obviously a disastrous night for St. Jesus Parish Choir. It was as well. Decimated, <laughs> <It was> decimated. <laughs> Just give it one more shout out. What were they called again? St. Jesus Parish Choir. St. Jesus, yeah. wow. Shout out. Go. I don't think they uh, exist anymore, to be honest. But it was that night. <laughs> that was the start of the end. <laughs> it was all downhill from there. Really, they got some second-rate ones in. They weren't quite cutting it. So, take me then from being this kid, dad's scouting at the club. You're playing a bit at school. Who who then saw that you had something about you? It was kind of a weird, a, a weird way it came about, really, because, like I say, my dad was a scout at Saints, but uh, a lot of the team that I played with at, at, at Blackbrook, they, they, I must have been about 13 out of 17 players signed professional contracts, whether it be at, so, whether it be at St. Helens, Widnes, Warrington, Wigan, yeah. whatever it may be, and I wasn't one of them. So I ended up going to... So my dad was the scout, and when your dad thinks you're crap, then you're, <laughs> yeah. you're up against it. But uh, I went playing rugby union uh, at did, a local so, club so, Sorry to interrupt, but did your dad not think you were good enough at that age? Did it, was he sort of mm. saying, have you thought about going back to the choir? Have you thought? <laughs> no, he just... Uh, he never quite got involved in, deeply in the rugby side of things. He said, if it happens for you, it'll happen for you. But he wasn't one to kind of push push me that in that direction. And it, funnily enough, I... I I went to a, an academy training session with my dad, but I wasn't part of the academy. I, I went kicking goals on, on, on the field on the far side, uh, just because I was playing rugby union, I was a goal kicker at the time, and yeah. just practicing. And the, the academy team were actually quite uh, short on a few players and probably wasn't run as well as it is uh, these days. And mm. uh, they were short on players for the week after. And, and a good friend of mine, Scott Barrow, who'd, who'd signed for the team, a guy you guys know quite well, uh, the coach asked him, you know, do you know any scrum halves who, who potentially could play this, this That week? guy over there practising. It, it was one of them, really, yeah. Well, Harry's lad on the, on the far field over there, he, I played with him I play with him for school, he, he, he's all right, like. So, so Scott Barrow's got a lot to... Um, yeah, he's got a fair bit, bit to thank for that. So, yeah, the coach went and asked me dad and said, he never told me about, about your lad and uh, would he want to come and train? And my dad just I kind of said, ask him yourself. So he came and asked me and I joined in training and... Uh, kind of signed a, an RFL like contract, not not signed official terms with Saints and, and played. Within played how long have been sort of come over here? You uh, so that was like a, I went Tuesday or Wednesday night, and then I played played in the academy on the Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it? Isn't That's it, crazy. Isn't it mad people's roots in? Yeah, you know, you always assume someone gets talent ID, right? They get picked up, and then it's like a really obvious route. I find <laughs> like a lot of the people who do fantastically well, it's never like an obvious route. You know, yeah. I think in the current Saints team, James Roby wasn't an obvious route. Yeah. Alex Wormsley, Alex Wormsley not yeah. an obvious route. Yeah. You know, Louis McCarthy, not. Yeah. There's a lot of people who don't go through what you would consider from the outside to be the obvious route to the top of your game. Yeah. And think about that. There's Paul's just stood at one end of a field kicking goals. And <laughs> if he hadn't have been there that night, what you, don't, you just don't know, do you? No, no. And I think what probably... like I was only a really small kid at school, so I was never... You know, physically developed, so I struggled with the physical side of the game up, up until a certain mm. age, until they hit, like 17, 18, and then suddenly became up towards six foot and started to handle, handle the physical side of things a bit better. And I think the game's learned a lot in that respect now in terms of not kind of discounting kids too, too soon because of the obviously the, the physicality, really, because uh, as we all know, you, you, you mature at different rates. Mm. We've had so many different type of characters on this podcast, which is what I love the most, is that, you know, I'm just thinking back to, remember when we had Lee Breers 
and he was saying that he was a proper rugby anorak and he yeah. collected balls and he remember he had a ball collection when he was about eight or nine yeah. all the different balls from the seasons gone by and shirts and so on and we've had some people who just weren't that arsed but went on to be absolutely superb w where do you sit in terms of that were you were you a, a bit of an anorak when it came to rugby league a sort of super fan as a kid yeah yeah, yeah. definitely watched a lot of rugby uh, you know played it as much as i can actually lee Breers grew up around the corner from from where i lived and i yeah. always remember lee being up and down the streets uh, with a ball in his hand, kicking for himself. Like he'd have a game with himself, Lee, a, a mm. full match, and he'd score it and different things. Like he was just such a rugby league boffin. And I, I was probably quite similar. And actually, in that academy game, which I got picked to play in, in my first academy game at Featherstone away, Lee actually was my half back partner in that game. Really? Do you wow. see kids playing rugby on the street anymore? <laughs> you don't do see do kids, kids play rugby on the all, street? Do kids don't play at all on the street. Do kids, do they? I. Really? Yeah, you, that's what you used to do, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, I think you see a little bit more of it in the summer when the weather's a bit, you know, yeah. a bit nicer. You, you know, but certainly not as, as no. often. As not like the M62, you know no. what I mean? I'm talking just a side street. It takes, don't it takes us back to the beginning of the we podcast. Just, There's too many people knocking about. We just don't come done <laughs> playing rugby on motorways. <laughs> anybody. Um, so, look, forget the choir. What would Paul Wellens have been had he not made it in rugby? Uh, well, I did actually start a university degree at, at, at Jill when I... When I had finished me my A levels and I was doing sports science now with a view to doing what I, I wasn't really sure but I come from a family of teachers a lot of a lot of my brothers mm. well two of my three brothers were teachers uh, me my twin sister taught for a while my mum was a teacher so I was thinking something probably a, along that along them lines really and that's probably why I suppose coaching the kind of uh, is something that I'm passionate about as well you know, you know to to go and try and help help mm. others after teaching after. rugby teaching rugby yeah yeah you are you are, is, yeah. you are a teacher now yeah, aren't you really of, in yeah. a certain way yeah. <laughs> mm. um so i'm mean, really interested about this period in your life that you, you signed this deal on almost you know professional terms from almost a bit of a freak mm. default moment in your life and then not long afterwards you're making your, your your debut i know we're fast forwarding a little bit but your debut for saints in in the late 90s what what was it like in terms of being accepted by all these saint stars in that dressing room in 97 98 it, it, it was a Kind of quite an intimidating environment to go into, but at the same time, when you look back, it was kind of part, kind of the making of me as well. Uh, I was always quite a, a shy kid when thrust into environments where I didn't feel comfortable. You know, in and around people that are normal, comfortable with, I, I'm, I'm fine. But I always find that that quite challenging. And I was a scrum half at the time, but one of the sides of the game I struggled with when I moved up to first team was actually ordering people around and talking a lot. Something that you know, a player you mentioned, Lee Bree, is something that he did naturally well. Uh, I, I really struggled with that side of things and there was a particular session in the back end of, of 1998 before I made my debut, Sean McRae made me do, we, we, we did a particular drill and he said no one's allowed to talk apart from Paul <laughs> and, and it was the most terri one of the most terrifying experiences in my life. Was it just silent? <laughs> I'd love to watch that. It was that. just me calling players, doing <laughs> things. What with no feedback whatsoever, nobody could no, say no, yes Paul. No. It was like running, running through a set of six but I had to call a, a player for every, every play in, in the set and then we did yeah. it again, then we did it again. Um, but when I look back at it now, it's it quite genius that yeah. he actually didn't care what I was saying and whether it was the right call or the wrong call. Mm -hmm. It was just getting me used to speaking, you the getting me used to ordering Apollo Perolini around, ordering Chris Joins around. And then after that exercise, I became not totally comfortable, comfortable but a bit more comfortable in, in mm -hmm. doing so. It's really smart. Yeah, it's really thing, smart, yeah. Coach. Yeah. Yeah. Because it lays down a marker that, to the other players that you're in charge as well. So it kind of shows them that he, he wants you to speak. Well, and, and it gives... You, a player belief, doesn't mm. it? Because what you're not sure, you don't want to speak sometimes in a situation like that because you, you're scared of people pointing you out as being a fraud, like for, you shouldn't really be here mm. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. For young players as well, yeah. that's a massive challenge. And I think the powerful thing was is the actual, you know, the players that were ordering round, they were responsive. They were going, yeah, I'll, okay, I've got you. Yeah, I'll do this. Yeah, I'll do that. And all of a sudden you think, well, yeah, they, they just, they want the best for you. Uh, you mm. know what so I mean? they all did. They kind of, did, but could they see the, the talent in a young Wellens then, even then? I think so, yeah. I mean, I mean, I was playing at the time, playing a lot in the. It was called the A team at the time. It was called the reserve. It's the reserve grade now, mm. and I was playing really well in the reserve grade. And uh, so there was a lot of talk about, you know, whether I was ready to make the step up. So uh, I know that, that Sean Long at the time, when he was he was the first team scrum half, Bobby Golden had just just left, and Sean Long had come in. And Sean Long said that like because I was playing so well as a scrum half in the A team, it had him on on his toes knowing that there's a young kid yeah, you know, yeah. beneath that's coming to take your shirt. Uh, yeah. 
Now, obviously, I made the transition to fullback a, a little while after that, but uh, yeah, I think there was kind of a bit of noise around the club whether I could, I could make that step up. Well, just on this, you speak about going into like a Saints dressing room full of all these people who you admire and whatnot. You, you, I believe you sort of need somebody there as an anchor or somebody there who, who you can bond with quickly. You and Andy Norvey had a very interesting relationship when you were younger, weren't you? Like he was, he was like some sort of roguish mentor. Andy Norvey, for people who don't know, if they don't know about him, he's tough. Tough fella, wasn't he? Yeah. Hard as nails, played league and union for Northampton. Yeah. But he, you know, some of the things he's a bit mad, wasn't he? Yeah, he's yeah. He was, he's a madman. I still see him a fair bit. He, he, he's, he's now the, the the coach of Liverpool St. Helens Rugby Union. And, uh, but at the time, obviously, he was playing in Saints first team, and I was playing in, in the juniors. And a lot of our mates, like some of my friends and some uh, some of his friends, were also friends with each other. So during that time in, in summer rugby, all our friends would be going out on a on a Saturday night on the drink and having the parties like, like you would do normally at that age, but we'd have a game the next day. So he'd come and pick me up and we'd go have a drive around town, go and get something to eat. And like you say, I was only 17, 18 at the time and he was 23, 24, but he probably, he probably looked after me, you know, as a young kid. And, and did he yeah. used to make you run up and down hills and flog yeah, you? Yeah, do stuff like that. <laughs> like tackle, up and just be see. smashing well so Put your yeah. boots on uh, and then we'd drive around town, pick up a few other lads who had never met in my life. and. <laughs> All of a sudden, we're having a big game of scrub and bash on the side of the East Lanks. <laughs> <Scrubs. East Lanks. laughs> on the East Lanks? <laughs> was, was he the referee? East he turned up to my house and they all, all he, had, he had a milk crate in the boot and a ball. And we went, we drove to the, si uh, to the side of the East Lanks and there was a massive hill. And he went, right, we're having this game. Uh, so he ran to the top of the hill, put the milk crate on the top of the hill, come down with a ball and he said, there's only one rule in this game and it's the first person to put that ball on that crate to the winner. <laughs> Go, picks the ball up and runs and we must have been on the side of the East Lanks for what must have been like 45 minutes to an hour. Just, just doing, police, yeah. police cars racing towards yeah, the are, are you taking this into 2023? I don't think so, no. no. <laughs> it was certainly character building, I'll tell you yeah, that. Amazing. I'd love to be driving down the East Lanks and just see... Just see yeah, Agnes' Parsi just trying to get a milk bottle, <laughs> trying to get a bottle on top of the milk. <laughs> get your own ideas, Wellens. <laughs> I mean, look, Paul, you had the most amazing career. And I know John was there for a huge part of it. Mark came in, played halfback with you in the grand final. He doesn't talk about it much and went off and <laughs> fucked off to Salford. Um, it was, I think, 15 seasons, you know, nearly 500. Was it 499? Does that annoy 495. you? 495. It was. I read 499. So does that annoy you? Five? Could it got to 500? Uh, it's just a number, as John Wilkinson. Yeah. Like, uh, like obviously, I played my last game at Wigan away in, in 2015. And yeah. I knew walking off the field that day, I think when I look back, I think I'm done here. I can't, yeah. I can't play a minute longer. And I always say it's better to burn out than fade away. You know, 100%. So. And look, over, over a thousand points scored, five Super League titles. Five challenge, challenge cups. five challenge cups, was it? Five challenge, five challenge cups, two World Cup challenges, is what yeah. I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. an, it's a hell of a mantelpiece, that. I mean, and look, you guys both played. Man of Steel. Uh, Harry Sunderland, yeah. Lance Todd, yeah. done a lot. Done Full house, yeah. clean sweep. He told me, he told me off air just <laughs> to mention those. <laughs> Make sure the Lance Todd and the Larry Sunderland get mentioned. Larry got, got the trophy here Larry's, for those of you yeah. for those who aren't Larry's, watching. Harry's twin Harry's brother. Yeah. For those who aren't watching, we got the trophy here. Mm. You've, all, you've all had your hands on it, apart mm. from me. Yeah. Um, so, Mark, come on, you haven't said much. So, when you first <laughs> met Weller, yeah, standard. You first met him. First impressions and what made him the player that that he was. <sighs> I thought. When I first met Weller, he was always the most likeable guy in terms of a teammate that would train hard, but then I also liked to, to enjoy himself off the field. I think he was a bit of a throwback to like the yesteryear of a professional sport. He was a pisshead. Yeah, a bit of a pisshead. But then he'd, you'd see him on a Monday morning on a treadmill, sweating it all out of himself. So he was very much that work hard, play hard mentality, which I always kind of liked and respected. I know John did. Um, and on the field... Yeah, I, I remember watching him when he was probably first coming through. He was a um, great player and someone you kind of you aspire to be like as a, as a professional. Similar to you then, work hard, play hard. Is that why you got on so well, you two? Not really, yeah, I think when I walked in, like when well, I was talking about walking into a dressing room, you're looking for somebody like who's a, a bit of a friendly face. Like, And I wasn't, you know, I, wasn't caught, I was a confident young guy, but walking into the dressing room at St. Helens, I didn't actually believe I was probably good enough to be there. And I only got developed my confidence probably through my friendship with Paul. Where I remember day one when I got there, the conditioner, a guy called Jeff Evans, was like, "Oh, we're going to this gym and playing squash." He gave me a lift down, 
and I was in the change room. Wello came over, said hello, and we were just chatting. And I was like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to something a bit more professional. Like where I've been, it's like you know, you take you either take a spare pair of boots or create a Budweiser yeah. for the. And it goes well. <laughs> I'm shatter you losing, but it's not that much. <laughs> you know what? Did you, did, so did, just, I just remember, did you bring a create Budweiser with you tonight? Because you offered me one no, before. Did red it, stripes in the. Oh, cupboard. you found it. There's right. a little cupboard. So I thought you walked stripe. around with those still. No, no. no. no Sorry, carry on. Yeah. Available. Yeah, so uh, Wello, uh, I bonded with Wello uh, pretty quick. And then over that first few years of being there, um, it was just a... It, you look back, actually, in maybe those three, 2003, four, five, and maybe a little bit of 2006, where we just wasted so much time doing nothing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. We did. We just. I don't know what you mean. No, in no, what no, way? We, we had, we had, that was the best time in my career because... I didn't, you didn't have any responsibilities. We mm. were young. We were earning okay money for what we did. We just, you know, it was 10 o'clock at night. We'd drive around to Wellows and watch stupid shit on telly. Is that wasting time? No, it's what not. You used to it's watch? not. It no. feels like it now what because you, you were an adult, doesn't it? Pretty much anything, didn't we? We just you know, we'd play on the PlayStation. We did, didn't we we? Star Wars. We did. Yeah. Right, so <laughs> one of our very good friends was a guy who was living with Paul at the time, a guy called Ian Barker, who subsequently came and lived with me. Burger Box. Burger, he, yeah, because he loves burgers when he's drunk. He, he actually ate four foot of Subway without knowing because he was that drunk. Anyway, He's now vegan, isn't Different he? story. <laughs> yeah. So Barks, Vegan Burger Box. Barks used to live with Wello. Yeah. But well, well, we'd be at Wello's, like just messing around playing PlayStation. And Barks, Barks had come in and he'd been at Bellevue, he was a, a bookie working on the dogs and stuff. And so he used to come in late at night and then we'd just stay up till one, two in the morning playing computers. But Barks used to fall asleep all the time. So we'd play FIFA with Barks. He'd fall asleep with the ball at his feet. Wello would nick the ball off him, score a goal, set it back up so he didn't... <laughs> so just cheating. But you did all this while winning trophies. Yeah, that's what I mean. It was like cool because you play on a Friday night. We'd definitely go out for a beer on a Friday. We'd probably have a beer on a Saturday. Um, Sounds trained. like a Craig David no, song. We, we trained hard. Like that's one thing that I, I got my head around real quick. Just when you were telling those stories, was it? Was it and I may get get my wires crossed. Was it? Was Paul Wellens up a tree once when you opened? Was it? No, was that Paul? John was no, up a tree. No, John, uh, James Roby and was it you and Ian Hardman were in the tree outside my house. <laughs> Why were you in the tree outside Paul's it's, house? It's a, it's a great question. Well, um, he wasn't allowed out, was he? No, 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 I no, 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 no. Just went home, it really. wasn't that at all. We'd been at, James Roby's dad's got a bar on the second floor of his house, or he did have. And in that bar, he collects absinthe. And I don't know if anybody's ever drank absinthe, but when you drink absinthe, you climb trees. Oh, do you? Mm -hmm. You climb things. That should be on the yeah. label. We climbed, so we climbed a tree and sang. Is it adjacent to Paul's songs. window? Or what? Yeah, but he's got his now, I think, pregnant <laughs> wife had moved it. Barks has gone. FIFA Barks. He's upgraded. Yeah, Barks wife's, wife's in, she's pregnant, and, and we're up a tree singing songs about Paul Wellens. He said now pregnant, not now. Not now. No, no, she was. What we singing number one is Paul Wellens, number two is Paul Wellens. <laughs> and number three, <laughs> to, be fair to, John, Wellens. to be fair to John, the next day he, he, uh, he bought all the neighbours a box of celebrations each and took them round. So <laughs> <laughs> what, what random present? Yeah. What, what, what do you mean? Is that an apology? Sold, apology gift? That's something sold at the garage. <laughs> <laughs> it was an apology gift because I felt so bad. But the worst thing was, I'm in a tree, sort of drunk, and I think Channel have sent, well, has been home for hours and we're arguing. We're having an <laughs> argument. <laughs> I'm in the tree. He's at the, down, out the tree. Just, we're just having like a full blown <laughs> argument. Get down. I'm like, no, I'm getting down. No, Come you on. get down. <laughs> Well, one of the one of the great quotes when I was doing a bit of reading into you, Wello was from uh, Jamie Peacock. He's been on the podcast as well, and he says it was clear what little regard Paul had for his own personal safety. And I think that every good fullback has to have a little bit of that. Is that something that you that ever crossed your mind? Because because it, it's actually so topical now, isn't it? When you think of you know, I'm thinking even someone like Steve Thompson in rugby union, yeah. I've heard him say something like that before. And I know you were a different type of player and so on, and he was a mole and he was a scrummager in that sense and, and things have come back to haunt him. But, and I think you've said that in the past, John, as well. You, you just didn't really consider what you were putting your, your body through or your head through at that time. Didn't, no, no. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't a thing back then, was it? No, no, it didn't, didn't, didn't even get talked about, did it? It's, no. uh, but like, and as well, you play the game. Like you, I think what you're always trying to do when you play rugby is, like, is you, 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 you want to prove yourself, but you're trying to prove yourself to your teammates, I think, first and foremost. You want your teammates to look at you and go, yeah, he cares and he's someone that we want in our team. And I think that's the way I always played the game. And obviously the position of fullback was quite often the last line of defence. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and and, and with that comes a responsibility to to put your body in, on the line. And uh, I, you know, I'd like to think I did. Now, obviously, there's a f few occasions where I didn't get it right, or, or you get beat, and and that can happen in, in in the sport. But it was never through a lack of you know a lack of commitment or a lack mm. of you know not wanting to p put your body where it needs to go. Well, I think Wello competed really hard. I think he's one of the most instinctive rugby players that I ever played with, as in, because he's not naturally blessed with speed. I think Paul, the way in which he played the game was different. Like he just didn't play rugby like that. Like people didn't play how Paul played. And there's a lot of there's temptation now for speed to be everything. Well, as you know, I think Paul having a lack of speed helped him develop such a rounded understanding of a game. And it's almost like a guy when they're really big, when they're young. I don't ever really think that they really get to understand how to play a game. Well, I think Paul, with, with the skill set, the physicality that he had, had to learn the nuances of the game. And, and as a fullback, I don't think there has been or is anybody positionally, defensively, organising as good as Paul Wellens has been. I just don't see anybody in the game. And, play, and Paul played it differently for such a long period of time. Um, and there's been other great fullbacks, but very different. I don't think there's ever been anybody. There's less Paul of those players, I think, in the game now as well, isn't there? There's more of an emphasis on athleticism and being big or strong or fast rather than just being a natural rugby player that can do a bit of everything. Yeah, but, but and then oh, the way Paul played his position without just banging on about how good it was as a player, it, it was different. He, he, he was a bigger fullback. He, he could play through the middle of the field he, he would support front rowers and, and get short passes through the middle of the field he, what I'm trying to say is that, that the way Paul played the game was really unique and really different and I don't actually think we will see somebody play fullback like that again because the game changes and it moves on but he was in my opinion um, the, the, the second best fullback that Saints have ever had after Paul Edgerson but did you need that <laughs> <laughs> well did you need that in your locker because as you said earlier you know you weren't the biggest John said you weren't the quickest. Did you need that aggression then to to have what you had in your, in your game? Yeah, like I said, I was always conscious. Because I think because the fact that I played halfback as a kid growing up, I always wanted to be in and around the ball anyway. Yeah. So my way of doing that from a full-back position was not being too far away from the ball and, and running support lines in and around there. So I played the majority of my game, what we call in between the scrum lines. And very rarely did I find myself going out that wide. But you know, as I got older and and, and uh, you know, input from coaches like Ian Millward and Daniel Anderson, I found, started to add a few things to my game in terms of turning up out wide a little bit more. Which, which, but I, I did always feel most comfortable through the middle of the field. And you know, as the fullback role evolved as time went on, and almost they were converting halfbacks into into fullbacks, so they could you know get execute a three on two out the back and different things like that. I started to feel like the the role was leaving me behind a little bit and, and the back end of my career I obviously found myself back in the forwards uh, playing 13 mm -hmm. every now and again or playing at standoff which which I didn't mind either it was a different challenge for me uh, but yeah it's you know I certainly I agree with you John I, I did play the game a little differently than, than I know a lot of full backs and you were probably the first of the, the modern era of out backfield players carrying the ball off their own trial end as well we see it a lot with wingers now don't we but there's like Zach Hardacre, people like that who play fullback, who do a lot of carries. That was a massive part of your game, wasn't it? Carrying the ball forward, getting getting the team on the front foot, and giving giving your big men a bit of a breather, really. Yeah, I used to pride myself on like trying to catch balls on the full, you know. So I used to study kickers quite a lot. Uh, you know, kickers at the time with the likes of uh, your, your Libriers, Andy Farrell, uh, Paul Deacon, those types. Of, I used to study and where they kick the ball more often, and so I could position myself in the right in the right place. And then I used to always pride myself on if they had a kick chase coming at me, like beating the first man. So if I could beat the first man and put a dint in their line and, and try and help get our set started. And, uh, you know, Daniel Anderson in particular, when he was coach at St. Helens, he loved having big players. I remember, obviously, John, he used to get you to weigh in, didn't you? You used to try and stick five kilogram plates down your underpants so, so, you'd, so you'd, <laughs> to, you'd come in heavier. Oh, God, it used to, yeah, it used to give me some. I had to be 100 kilos, but I was 95 kilos. And, it, it, and basically what I worked out is if... I had to, it wasn't a five kilo, I had, there was a hammer, a claw hammer. I put the claw <laughs> hammer and then I had to put a two and a half kilo weight down the back of my shorts. And then I had to stand side on with my legs sort of crossed on the things and it just got me overweight. So Danny was like, 
Keep it up. Keep eating. Keep eating. Like, <laughs> well, otherwise, he wasn't going to pick you. Yeah, he went 100. Like, if you're not 100 kilos, you're not getting in. <laughs> he was quite big on having uh, size. So, like myself, uh, like I was at fullback. Eddie Garner was on the wing and Francis Melly was on the other wing. And I was the lightest at 95, 96 kilograms at the time. So, we had quite a... There was a period when you put quite a bit of weight. Yeah, 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 2003. Don't, don't speak about 2003. <laughs> so. Need to get some photos in 2003. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, yeah. the one year in my career where uh, I let myself down. 2003. Did you? Got unfit, out of shape, and it took me a while to get back to the levels that I needed to be at. But after that experience, I just said never again. What, what was your best year then, Paul? I would there say was a, there was a year when you were untouchable, but I, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Oh, when six, that was. No? 2006 was probably the most. I, I reckon was that was that vintage Wellens that treble, six, treble, treble five, year. six, seven. Yeah. Will knows. I played my best rugby between 2004 and 2007, eight, I reckon. But uh, 2006 was probably when I was at my peak. Yeah, yeah. I, I, so obviously, the, you know, I was going to ask you the sort of stand up moment in your career because I remember all the emotion that poured out in 2014, and obviously that was a year before you hung yeah. up your boots and so on. But would you say 06 was, was was the year? But is there a specific moment that you would go, wow, I remember that in the nursing home? Yeah, well, I think the 2014 experience is one that I'll remember just to the pure relief. Obviously, you know, John Yu was part of the, the squad that, that lost five grand finals that we were involved in at Saints, and that was. You know, to lose a grand final is disappointing mm. enough. When you string five together on the run, it just seemed like one prolonged nightmare. So to go back there in 2014 and finally win it, you know, the reaction that you saw from me on the field that day wasn't mm. like, it, it was just pure relief to finally get back there and win one. But I would say 2006, when I look back at 2006, that's the point in my career where I felt like I was always a bit, I always had a bit of self doubt. But in 2006, I walked onto a field thinking, I've got this covered today. I, I knew exactly what was expected of me. The fact that you know the teammates that I had and the quality team that was playing behind as a fullback, I went, well, these guys definitely know what they're doing. Mm. And it's probably the, the mm. one of the few times in my career I go onto a field with a team going, we're going to win today, mm. and absolutely no winning. And that's the first time, John, wasn't it? In 40, 40 years that a team had won the treble. It was it? Yeah. Good start. Incredible. Well, that's what I read. Yeah. It? It, was, it, was just, we had just, it was ridiculous, that team, at that time. We were flawed. We were like flawed in lots of ways, mm. but we had a great team. There, um, there was one game in particular at Nosley Road. We beat Leeds in 2000, back end of 2006, and we, I think we were like 28 13 in the upper half time, and we just blitzed them off the park. And obviously, it probably wasn't a good experience for Leeds, but we certainly rattled their cage and they come back and, and got us a few <laughs> times after that. But, uh, you know, I remember thinking after that game, wow, we are some team. Like, I just couldn't believe how well we were playing. Yeah. But bearing in mind, you went on to become so vocal and, as John said there, like, you know, such an organiser from, from fullback. How was that, that timidness, that shyness coached out of you? Is that, is that what happened? You know, that you, just, you sort of painted that image of you being desperately shy as a kid. Yeah, well, I wouldn't say I was desperately shy. I was desperate. I was shy in, uh, in in environments where I was unsure. Uh, you know, in and around with my family, with my friends, you know, down you know, whatever it may be socially, I'm, I'm absolutely fine and, and, mm -hmm. and kind of quite quite enjoy you know th th those environments. But w when I was unsure, is when I kind of clammed up a little bit as a kid. But you know, the experiences that I had, and then playing in winning teams and and getting the respect of my peers that. That just grew my confidence, and and once my confidence grew, I became as comfortable in that environment as I was with my family, and, and it never be, never was an issue again. Have you have you never had that feeling? Not even you know away from rugby, anything where you're not sure, where you've you felt like that, no, 17, 18 year old. Not really since. No, I think I've just grew grew in confidence as, as the years gone by, and I think again it's probably a good lesson for me now as a coach when you work with young players is to actually look back at that and think actually where you was at yourself, and and actually you do need time to to feel comfortable in different environments particularly you know full-time environments if you're if you're a young player now and you're surrounded by Roby, Lomax, Makinson, Wormsley those types of players it can be a daunting experience. I think some people naturally carry confidence with them as well like you, you're around people in life who, who have naturally got confidence without experience but for some people confidence is a, is a time it takes time and, and I think we're so eager to thrust confidence in the modern world upon young people but sometimes it just takes a bit of time to earn that mm. confidence, and you have you have to invest in getting it. Yeah. And it comes think, through. There's a misconception that you can just say, "Well, you 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 either have it or you don't." Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes yeah, you yeah. might not have it, but there's not not to say that, that you can't. You can't get it. Get I think it, it's yeah. important if you're coming into a team environment to be humble and to like earn that respect of people as well. I've, I think, especially in a rugby league dressing room, you need to earn those stripes and show everybody that you're there for the right reasons and you've, that you've not got a chip on your shoulder. And all the best players I've played with have had that mentality as they've come through into a team. Mm. 
Um, look, I really want to sort of spend a, a big chunk talking about you as a coach and finding out what makes you tick now as a coach. And I know you've only been a head coach for what, four months. Um, you hung up your boots in 2015. You had seven years working as assistant. You're a player performance manager. You work with the reserve team, work yeah. with the kids as well. I, is it frustrating given the career that you had sometimes being an, an assistant when you're not the main voice and you don't get the final say and you have to go along with, you know, sometimes things that you don't agree with? No, no, definitely not. I, I, I knew that at the back end of my playing career, I knew that I wanted to coach. But then I also had to kind of take a step back and go, you know, look, there's a bit of a process I've got to go through here. You know, as you do when you're a player, you don't just jump from uh, playing at Blackbrook at under-16s into Saints first team. You have to go in the academy. You have to mm -hmm. go through different experiences, win, lose, fail at times, then go through into the reserves, suffer some of the same things, find your way in the first team environment. And uh, I've approached it very similar as a coach, really. And, you know, those early years of me coaching, working with our scholarship in the academy was invaluable to me in terms of getting hours on the field delivering. Because uh, you, you have the rugby knowledge, you know, that's there from, from, from years of playing. But it's a completely different thing, actually coaching and delivering and making sure that you, the knowledge that you're passing on to those young players, that they're actually understanding it. And there's different ways you can go about it. And so I was very conscious around learning about what coaching is and what it looks like. Uh, not just with, and I didn't do that just within rugby. I, 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 I enrolled on a, a, a course called, it was the UK Sports Aspire programme, which it was 22 coaches going on eight residentials over two years. Uh, and I didn't, it was nothing to do with rugby league. It was working with coaches from all, pr predominantly uh, Olympic sports. So it was like you, you row in, taekwondo, judo, boxing, different things like that. But I learned so much from that experience around just coaching in itself and listening to different people and how they went about it. And, uh, you know, that was a, an invaluable experience for me on my, on my coaching journey. And then I found myself, again, I suppose you come back to the, the confidence side of things, becoming more confident as a, as a coach and being able to deliver on field. When, when you finished in 2015, was it always a route to being a head coach? That was always the sort of the dream, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and no, I'm not going to lie, being head coach at St. Helens, that, that, that was a dream as well. Uh, but, but at the same time, it, like, I, like I said, it, it's, I knew that there was a process that I needed to, to go through in, in that respect. Uh, and also, I didn't want to get this intelligence coach's job based on the fact that I, I, was, a, I was a player there, because it's just not good enough. And when, when I actually spoke to Eamon and Mike after it was Christian made it known that he was going back, I made it clear to them that they, they, they need to pick the best person for the job. You know, when... When they went and got just Justin Holbrook, they identified who they wanted and they went and got him. With Christian Wolfe, they identified the person who they wanted to go and get and they got him. And I was adamant that they went through that same process. And then if it wasn't me, that's fine. Uh, you know, I can, I can accept that. Uh, but you know, thankfully, they, they, they saw something in me to, to give me the opportunity and I hope, and I hope I can repair them. Did you have any doubts on your own coaching career and working at Saints after, after Kez, after Kieran Cunningham? Because... He's an absolute legend of the club, great bloke, but he probably didn't work out as he would have wanted as a coach. Did that kind of put doubts in your mind that it's not always the, the, the dream job that it would be based on his experience? Well, potentially it might not be, you know, and that's the reality of the situation. What people have got to understand, I've gone, I've gone into this situation with my eyes open. And as Alex and Tellens, there are no grey areas. There's win and there's lose, and that is it. Mm -hmm. So it's not, oh, we finished fourth, we made the playoffs, well done. I know I'm on the starting blocks this year and the expectation is, is for me to bring home silverware. Mm -hmm. So, but there's a, there's, a, there's a strength in that, is that there is no confusion. I know what the expectations are. I understand why people draw comparisons to Kieran's situation, but you know what a lot of people forget about Kieran as well. He was probably a, 40, uh, a Kevin Sinfield 40-20 away from getting to a grand final at the back end of 2015 as well. So there are fine margins at the top end of the game as well. And I've actually had a, a number of chats recently with, with Kieran around the job and the pressures that it, that, that it entails and he's been so helpful uh, you know he's a, he's a wonderful guy he's obviously moved on into a different area of his life now with his business that he's running and he's so happy he's got grandkids of his own and it's great to see that he, you know him, him doing so well in life uh, because it, no, no doubt it was probably a tough period for him the way it ended at St Helens but you can see off the back of it, he, he, he's learned so much from that experience and, and not just that, he's passing some of that experience off back to me to help me on my journey. It's the inevitability of coaching though that I think sometimes <laughs> the likelihood is 
people lose their jobs, don't they? Yeah. And it, that's the reality, the brutal reality of it. You know, and, but they in, haven't, have they? In terms of Christian and Justin, no, it's been so no, that, the bar's yeah. so high, yeah. there, and they've walked off and sailed onto bigger things, or you know, yeah. on and their own terms. We can't. Under, that's it's quite a rare thing that. Yeah. You know, and, and, and coaching is quite a brutal, brutal environment. Was there any hesitation when the job was out there? Absolutely not. No. Not one I mean, second, not well, one second of doubt, not one even, oh, should I wait or should I go? No, not, not at the time. I, in, in, in Christian's last year, there was talk whether Christian was going to stay on or not. And I was thinking in my own mind was like, if Christian stays on, as, as, uh, does another year or two years, I'm more than happy to stay as his assistant for for, for, for that period of time but I was also thinking but if he does decide to, to move on I, I feel ready now to, to, to make that step up Was there any hesitation or would there have been any hesitation had it come up sooner when Justin left would, if the, the opportunity had come to coach Saints then would there have been hesitation or do you feel like you've, you've got the, the miles under your belt you've done, done enough as assistant to, to do it now Well I, people might not know this but I actually interviewed for the job when Justin did leave but looking back now, I go, I'm so glad I didn't actually, I didn't get the job at that point. I'm so glad I had the opportunity to, that Christian came in. I got to work with him for three years, learned so much more off the back of that experience. And I reckon now, hand on heart, I reckon if I'd have got it at that, at that time after Justin, it would have been too soon. But what, what was the reason that you didn't get it from Eamon? Well, I, I just feel that the, the Christian was the man that they wanted, the experience that he got as a coach. He'd, he'd had more head coaching experience than I, than I had. I had. Uh, you know, so, uh, yeah, I think they just went for, for the man that, that they thought was best for the job. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm so glad they made that decision because I got to work with a fantastic person, a fantastic coach for three years and learnt so much off the back of it. I think people's coaching philosophy interests me well because like, some of that is inherent within you. That's you. Right, so you're going to bring some of your personality and your style to it. But then also, you, as when you're a player, you, you learn so much from coaches who you've played under and worked with. So I'm just going through the list of coaches that you've had and just thinking about one thing that you would take from, from them. So who's the first, first team coach when you were in Sean McRae? Sean McRae was, uh, yeah, was the guy who gave me my debut. Yeah. Uh, the silent treatment. He, he was meticulous yeah uh, i always remember one of his video sessions the first, like we didn't do a lot of that many video sessions when we were playing in the juniors and, and reserves but you know one of his video sessions at the time went on for a long long time and we we're going through so many plays and so many different you know, permutations that may or may not happen and i just remember how how meticulous it was in his, in, in his preparation so it was detail from sean mccray then it was ellery hanley ellery hanley was unbelievable at giving me confidence in a first team environment like I, I, He'd do some like strange things at times, but but like he just like once he just he walked through the down the corridor and he handed me a letter, and it just said like Paul Wellens on it, and and I opened this letter, and it'd been handwritten by him, and he was just like, hi Paul, uh, just wanted to let you know you are a, a, a delight to coach, coming to work with you every day is, is a is a joy, and like this letter was just like that's like, brilliant. It was just a subtle thing that you go, well, like, and he could have stopped you and told me, but it was more of an official. Like, I bet you felt made, 10 foot tall yeah, after reading that. It made you feel so, like, it made you feel you belong in that environment, but it gave you so much confidence and belief to, that you belong there. And I remember there was one conversation when, because I, I just started getting more established in the first team, and he basically said to me, if you're fit, you're playing. Uh, when I was, I was in doubt over whether I was going to play for this injury. And he said, if you're fit, you're in my team. And when he said that to me, I thought, wow, like, I'm, I'm here. And, and so, Ellery had that kind of aura about him that he walked into a room and, and it, well, he was he was Ellery Hanley. That was it. Yeah. So it was de detail from Sean McRae. Then we've got confidence from yeah. Ellery Hanley. Yeah. And then Ian Millward is a guy who we both both work with. Yeah. And I'd be guessing it's saying just tactical Ta genius. Yeah, tactical genius, yeah. Like, uh, so at the, at the time when he took over the Ellery's team, we were a team that that played for each other with. So for, we were, we were like Ellery Hanley. We uh, all the effort areas were there, but we probably lacked. To, like a bit of a, a rugby brain, a tactical mind to go, you know, if you just did this little bit different or if you did this little bit different. And then Ian Millwall brought that to us and then our game went to the next level. Uh, so obviously we, we won the grand final in 1999 under Ellery and things were getting a little bit sour and stale, you know, for one reason or the other. Couldn't quite put my finger on it myself. But then Ian Millwall came in and just kicked us on another level and we ended up winning the competition again at the back end of that year.
And another man, Daniel Anderson, came after that. Daniel Anderson would have been structure, organisation, actual management. Because yeah. what, what you find as well in coaching, this is why I wanted to just go through the timeline, is what you find in, I suppose, is business, life, coaching, whatever it is, is that you jump from one thing yeah. to another at times. Yeah. You know, you, you go from almost not one extreme to another, but you're always sort of wavering either side of a line, yeah. really organised, a bit more emotional. You know, you do that yeah. quite a lot. And that was the shift between Ian Millward, who was yeah. emotional, recklessly emotional sometimes, to Daniel Anderson, on it. Yeah, and I also, I also think with coaching as well, like it doesn't seem whether someone's a good coach or a bad coach, but are you the coach that that organisation needs at the time? Because if you followed, if you're following someone who's just been exactly the same as the bloke before and the bloke before, then things have become stale and stagnant. I think you know that change up in personality sometimes, and every now and again you need you need a taskmaster to go in there and you know get people on point and make sure the discipline's right. Right, but off the back of that, sometimes you might need someone who's a little bit more relaxed, who's a little bit more upbeat. So it's finding the right person as well as the right coach. It depends on the playing squad as well, doesn't it? Absolutely. So if you've got a young, impressionable squad, that's very different from an experienced team that have been there, done it, who've ticked all the boxes. Yeah. Someone who can really probably mould themselves towards the environment that they're in. And I speak of this through my experiences more so as a player than as a, than as a coach. I mean, I'm I'm in my infancy as a certainly as a head coach, and I've probably got to find a lot of things out over the next few years you know about myself as a coach as well which I'm excited about but yeah certainly my playing experiences are, are, you know you get to understand and how different coaches work and the personalities and how other personalities can rub off on the team as well in terms of Justin and I mean John spoken so highly of Justin because obviously he was playing and you were on the coaching staff there as well and and obviously Christian coming in as well what have you taken from from those two what were their strengths what were their their weaknesses how different will you be to to those two who had such huge success over the last four years well, uh, again like justin came in with a real positive energy at the time so at the time obviously like i i think and i was involved in this the, the club was struggling but we had a lot of people involved at the time who were emotionally attached to the club so myself i include that obviously kieran has been there a long time mike roche and Eamon and and you know when when you when you're kind of looking, searching for answers when things aren't going well, you start looking out here, where's the, where's the answers? And, and, and what Justin taught me is that the answers are right under your nose when things are not going wrong. It's getting back to the basic fundamentals of working hard for each other, having respect for your environment, having respect for your teammates, but also coming to work with a smile on your face and really, really enjoying what you do. You know, being a rugby league player and being a professional rugby league player is a huge privilege mm. and that can't get lost on you. And I think it got lost on quite, quite a few of the players. Uh, you know, at that time in St. Helens. So, but Justin come with a real positive energy, but he, he, he had the balance right. So we had a games room, for example, the pool table went, the darts board went, you know, we're not, we're not here to play pool really? and darts. We're here to, mm -hmm. we're here to work and enjoy it. But he got complete buy-in from all the players. Uh, I can't imagine that came back under Christian, the darts. No, no, board. it didn't. Uh, no, no. <laughs> bigger wrestle room, was not it? Yeah, bigger wrestle room. Or something <laughs> like, and what, what you saw from Christian is that, like Christian, he, he comes across as a bit of a scurvy bloke at times. He's got a quite hard exterior. Say at times, probably yeah, 100%. Yeah, quite a, quite a, off, a on face looking guy. Camera. Oh, yeah, that's all we see, all we know, see isn't it? I know, but I, when I've been working at Sky, I watch him, and he's all light-hearted, smiley, sort of walking around, chatting with people. Then as soon as he stands in front of the TV camera, it's like that. Well, Iceman, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> then, like, uh, like the, you know, it, it, can, it, it can come across as intimidating, particularly when he, when he first comes to the club. and uh, Behind the know, scenes as well, right? Not, yeah, just, yeah, what, not just what we see on a Max little bit, but like perhaps not. I didn't find it that way, but I think you know a few of the lads they've gone from Justin being so upbeat and happy and having jokes and laughs all the time to Christian being a lot more serious. I so what is that? Is that a defence mechanism? No, no. I think it's just just yeah. him. It's his personality. It's, it's his personality. I think he, you know he grew up in a, in a in almost a bipolar, isn't it? To Queensland. switch, yeah. to be able to switch like that. So it seems quite strange to be able to to yeah. go onto that sort of mode on a match day or whatever from. <laughs> From from warm to cold, almost. Yeah, I mean, but I, I think you know the, the 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 assumption that it is cold, but that's not him. And what I got to see because because my family and his family became really close in his time here, and our kids became friends with each other as well. Is that mm. I saw the the Christian Wolf, the, the, I saw the father, I saw the, the husband, mm. uh, the, you know, the affectionate side of him, how close he was, and how much he'd do anything for his kids. A lot of the players don't get to see that 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 side of the, of the person, so I never quite really 
saw the intimidating side because I knew what he was really like. Mm. He'd probably kill me for letting people know that he's a bit of a soft. He's a big softy. But but in the in in the right way. And I think you know. But but as time went on, the lads really you know the the, the grew an affection for him uh, and because they see how much he cared for the group and and. And, and how, how much he cared about the club doing well. Would it be right in saying that COVID came at a good, not a good time for Christian, but he'd come in, you know, and it was at that break or that period of, of COVID, then since sort of started before COVID a little bit, you know, it was a bit up and down. And then after that, it just flew yeah. for you, didn't it? Yeah, well, I think it says a lot about him as a coach that obviously he sensed that, you know, things weren't going as well as, as, he, as he liked. And, and the first thing he did was look at himself and uh, you know he, he went through I won't, can't, won't bore you with the details but he went through a really thorough process of a bit of a fact finding mission about what people thought about him and his coaching methods uh, and that's what quite big of him though isn't it very big yeah and what, what you know, we pride ourselves on it sometimes is being able to have those own open and honest conversations and uh, you know it took a lot of courage for him to put himself out there the way he did uh, and off the back of that, we provided him with some feedback on you know, what it's been like previous, how it's different under him, you know, what a lot of the qualities that he brought out, what are the things that we feel it, that he can improve on. And he, and, he, and he tried his damnedest to make those changes. And, but like, was and it written feedback? But who wrote this? Yeah. Who said this? Anonymous <laughs> post box. Anonymous. Well, oh, this is your handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> Did you care what people think about you? Uh, I would say every person does on some level. Uh, you know, particularly the people closest to you and the players. You know, certainly from a coaching perspective now, uh, and I want to earn the respect of the playing group. You know, that that's what Justin did. That's what Christian did before me. So I want to, I want to, I want to do the same. And I've got their respect in terms of uh, as a person, mm -hmm. as a friend, and some some of them have played a lot, uh, alongside and as an assistant coach, I would imagine. But I haven't got their respect yet as, as a head coach. There's a, there's a big, big distinction between being liked and respected, isn't there? Yeah. And as a professional, whether in business or in sport or as a person, really, you don't have to be liked, but as long as you're respected, that's the most important thing, isn't it? Yeah, and I think you know, what, what you always want, you don't have to look at your playing. Like, at some point throughout your playing career, you're going to get bad news off a coach at some point, yeah. whether it's you're not playing or I don't think you're playing well enough, or you know, whatever it may be. But you always, you'd, you'd always remember as a player being lied to, or not being told the truth in the in the right way. But and you always remember the conversations were, well, I didn't really like what I heard, but at least he was honest with me. Uh, and and you remember those instances throughout your own career. So I reckon you know that's something that I take forward. Like I'm, I'm happy having conversations with players, and but what I will always be is upfront and honest with them. You know whether they agree with me or not. Because I, I know as the top player you were, you had criticism, obviously, at that elite level of the game. But it's only magnified when you're a coach, isn't it? Are you ready for that side of it in terms of the outside criticism and the media and the scrutiny yeah. and the things written about you and the things that aren't true that are written about you and the, yeah. you know, the, the social media side of things? It's, yeah, it's a whole you, new world, isn't it? And you throw on top of that the fact that I'm, I'm, I'm a St. Helens boy, I live in St. Helens. And St. Helens is a bit of a goldfish ball when it comes to, to rugby league. Like They're that. always going to throw, like Mark did, the Cunningham comparison at you as well. That if it's not going right at some stage, it's like, oh, this is Cunningham part two. And it, it, it all, it, you know, it, I've always said this, is that all my adult life, I've, I've either been a Saints rugby player or I've been involved with the club in the first team on, on, on some level. The so choir days aside, <laughs> choir obviously days the, choir, aside. the 12 years but of choir. <laughs> my, my adult life, being in and around town and people coming up to me and talking about rugby league, it's not something that takes me by surprise. That's actually normality for me now. Mm. Uh, but I, I do take on your point, Will, that, 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 that it gets magnified now. Uh, mm. you know, when do you sense that? Uh, do you, you know, when you were an assistant and I, I've never coached and I, I haven't ever put myself out there to coach and I think it's incredibly I think it's a great thing to do to coach people for a living I think it's an incredible gift to, to in develop and enhance people but the pressure difference from being an assistant to being a head coach obviously you haven't played any games yet but have you noticed the switch in your mentality or intensity towards a job or is that not really kicked in yet because the season's not over. No, no, there has been a switch and it's funny, I spoke to, uh, and I suppose you won't mind me saying, but Tony Smith, who's, who's now coaching at uh, OLFC next year, when I spoke to him a, a few weeks ago, he said that, you know, one thing that you'll find is, you know, people can tell you about being a head coach and what it's going to be like and you can get different advice from, from here, there and everywhere, but until you actually put those shoes on and walk in, walk in them, then 
you never really actually know, which yeah. was actually quite liberating for me to hear that because I thought, well, that, that, that's good to hear. Yeah. Uh, because things are going to come away which may take me by surprise at times. So I suppose it's been, been adaptable. But yeah, there certainly has been a, a change in focus there for me. And I think to being, there's been on it and then there's been proper on it. And that's what, as a head coach, I know the difference where, like sometimes after training when I was an assistant coach, I put my bag over my shoulder, go off home, and then maybe not maybe think about anything until I came back the next day. I'm not afforded that luxury anymore, nor do I want that luxury. No. Uh, it's, you know, my job is to drive the standards, making sure that the detail, the planning and everything's, you know, working in the right direction. And I'm fantastically supported there by, you know, you two guys you know well, Nathan Mill and Matt Daniels, head of uh, performance and head of medical. So, you know, you need pe good people around you and, and there's not just those, there's, there's other, others others as well. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's certainly going to be a challenge, but, it, it, you know, I'm going into it with, with my eyes wide open. And, and well, how beneficial is that to you that you know everyone at the club from the kit man to the tea lady to the people that work in the club shop to the medical team that you said... Um, compared to Christian who came in completely cold, not knowing anyone in the group of players and behind the scenes, will that have its advantages and disadvantages for you? Yeah, potentially both. I think every, with everything, there's opportunities and there's threats, isn't there? And, uh, you know, what, what, uh, uh, in taking over the job, say one of the advantages is the famili familiarity of, of everything. So if I was to go and take over X team, uh, you know, a team over the Pennine, say, uh, tomorrow, I may be going and approach that situation a lot differently than I'd approach the one that I'm in now because I understand the team, I understand the club, the group, I know what they value, I understand the journey they've been on in the last few years. So if I was to go in now, I'm going to go, right, we're going to do everything the complete Paul Wellens way, rip up all this great stuff that you've been doing for the last few years, they're going to look at me and think I've gone, I've gone do lally, aren't they? So uh, what I aim to do is I'll try and put my, my own stamp on things, but incrementally over a period of time. With, with, whilst at the same time retaining, obviously, a lot of the great stuff that we are doing and have been doing for a long, long time, which the foundations of our success have been built upon. How, how do you want to be considered and described as a coach? And I know you, you've, you've had such a big run-up to this, and you, it's not just suddenly like, oh, I'm going to be a head coach. You've been thinking about this for years and years and years. Yeah. And, and suddenly, come February, here we go. And after game one, that's when... You know, and I know you're not too concerned about the outside noise, but that's when you will be judged, as it were. So, so how, how do you want to be thought of as a, as a coach going forward? Well, I think what, what I am about, about this team and, and, and the town where I'm from, you know, I'm passionate about it. And I want, I want the people to turn up and see the players play with that, the same passion that I have for the, for the team doing well. Uh, and there's a lot of other things that go... You know, with that as well, you know, there's obviously an attention to detail and uh, a work ethic around how we go about it. But essentially, that to to play with passion, to actually feel something and feel a connection with the team and the town. I, you know, I would go as far to say I don't think the the support of you know the town, the community, and the team have ever been as strongly connected as they are right now. Uh, and I think that's really powerful for us moving forward. And it's something that I want us to build upon. Mm. It, it's really interesting because. Of, of how of how you're going to do things differently from what from what you've seen and maintain that success. Just going back to to Christian, there was no transition from Justin whatsoever, was there? It was just seamless. It was just overnight. He kept on, on the surface, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. That's all I can see is the surface. Although yeah. what I'm asking from behind the scenes, then how did he maintain that level? Because that's exactly what you want to do, right? You want to come in. You want to continue. It's, it's just been there's been no seesaw from Justin to Christian and now to Wellens. Yeah. So. I mean, it's, it's maintaining, obviously, the, the, we're t we, we're, it's built on work ethic, first and foremost. I know it's, a, it's an easy line to throw out. It's mm -hmm. about working hard for each other, but, but it, it, it's right. It's, it's it, you know, and we're not, I don't believe, you know, quite often when you see a team that's been successful for a prolonged period, there's, a, there's an assumption that the, the, they're doing something uh, a lot different than everybody else. I don't, I don't believe that's the case. I think we're doing it with a, a consistency and an attention to detail with a good group of people who are prepared to sacrifice a little bit more. Uh, you know, when you when you look at you know the amount of players that have, have either A, come through our system or been in the team a long, long time as well, I think that we have a real connection uh, of, of wanting to wanting to do well for each other. It's deeper than just just the rugby team getting together. And uh, it's important that. 
you know, you, you keep mentioning connection, like passion and connection. And, and in sport, you know, how often is somebody completely connected to a, a club? Mm. Now, you can be, you know, there's people who move around clubs and yeah. you can be. But your life has been about a connection with the town and the club. Yeah. And that's something that's really, I think, really rare and it should be valued and cherished because genuine passion. And I felt it at St. Helens. And the reason I mention it is because when I went to play for Toronto for two, two years, it blew my mind that a lot of people just played rugby and didn't care, mm. but didn't really have a genuine passion. Yeah. They had a passion yeah. for the job. There's a difference in there. I'm saying they had a passion for rugby and playing it, but they didn't, they weren't completely invested in the club that they're playing for. And that, that's something that I really look back when I was at St. Helens. I was like, man, that consumed my life, you yeah. know, for I, such a long time. From all my career, and I'm not saying it because he's here, I, 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 I think about all the players that have played for clubs and I think Paul is the most invested in his, his own hometown club than anybody I've played with. One thing that has always stuck out in my memory was we played Magic Weekend at City against Warrington, I think. And we got battered. Got slapped, yeah. Yeah. And you did a, an infamous, well, a famous interview afterwards where you said, you mentioned the fans paying the hard-earned money to watch us and how we needed to give the jersey more respect and give those fans more respect than than play how, how poorly we did it on, on that day. And it made me really think about the um, responsibility you've got as a professional athlete. And it was it was your, your comments and your words that really stuck out to me. I think you probably played your full career and you, you'll coach and you'll, you'll be a head coach of the club with those values in mind, knowing that you know, you've got a big responsibility on your shoulders. But the challenge as well is, Flash, with that, I, I think, right, it's, <laughs> well, has got that, right? <laughs> I'm yeah. fine with you, Paul. Yeah. I'm saying what he has is a real privilege to have that. You can take a lot of time. I think maybe one of the bigger challenges for coaches is getting people who are just coming into your organisation, yeah. younger players who are coming into that organisation, yeah. players who might be just passing through for a year in, into that yeah. way of thinking. Yeah, I mean, it, it's li little things as well. I remember when we won the Cup in 2021 after Wembley and we, we had a, the open top bus parade through town and I was kind of at the back of the bus and just looking around and you go through every area of town, you go through the more affluent areas, you go through the less privileged areas, you see all sorts of different people lining the streets. You saw, you know, old folk in wheelchairs, 90 odd years of age, getting wheels to the end of a driveway with smiles on their faces, waving up to toddlers in prams cheering and different things like that and it's very easy to jump on an open top bus like that drive through town wave at a few people and actually not think about what you've just actually experienced mm. and one of the exercises that we did after that we actually sat the group down and gone tell us what tell us about that and initially it was like yeah it was good wasn't it yeah yeah it was good like great and I'm like no no but what did you see like you have to tell us what you see you can't experience something like that and not think about it you know, more deeply. And when the actual conversation got flowing and started to mention you know, the, the little toddlers or the 90-year-old uh, old lady who got pushed to the end of a thing and uh, you know, areas of town where families are beaten out of food banks, uh, you know, that's the reality of the situation. Mm -hmm. Some areas of town that are, are privileged, but a town lying in the streets and you wouldn't know whether they were rich or whether they were poor because they all had smiles on their faces. And that was, that was a massive one for me. Just that the, that's the impact that you guys as a rugby team can have on this town. Sports it? entertainment. Mm. And it, people are entertained by it. And, yeah. and but but more than just entertainment, though, isn't it? There's, yeah. there's, there's more of a visceral feeling of like, happiness with, rather yeah. than watching wrestling. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, but it, ultimately, that, the, the, they want to be entertained by the, that sport, don't they? Yeah, mm. and I think it is deeper. Like, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's pride. It's geography. And, and, yeah, it's and we'll tribal in that area. area. Yeah. Yeah. But again, we, we, we don't get, uh, we don't get 90,000 fans to a game. No. But there's 90,000 Saints fans in the town. And so there's a, there's a sense of belonging. Uh, that, that's what I think it is. It's Glory a, supporters, well, uh, call them out. No, the, <laughs> they'll come to games. Bloody hell. People generally will go who, who yeah. maybe can't go or for different circumstances. But they, will, they will surely, Paul, have more of a connection with you being there, being the homegrown boy, right? Leading well, them, if the success, if the rugby continues the way it has been, yeah, that's the aim, right? To fill the stadium and to get it back to those days. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like that that connection straight away. I, I go in and around town now, and people are so passionate for not only the team to go well, but they want they want they want me to do well. A lot of the people that have come yeah. across, and mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm obviously 
so grateful for, for, for that support. I suppose on, on the, the other sense is that, you know, I have, to a lot of people, I'm still L Little Wellow, who came through the, the team 20 odd years ago. And <laughs> not, there's a, anymore, almost but. like a maternal instinct with me, with a, particularly a lot of the old days within the town as well. So there's a, there's a, there's a big, there's like quite a curve factor there. Look after our Paul. <laughs> yeah, <there's laughs> Don't suck our Paul. <laughs> no. how, how will it be different, Paul, with you in charge? Like style, what, what can people expect? What can those Saints fans expect? Because that's what's going to be so fascinating is the first few weeks we're going to see what, what your brand of rugby is and does it need to change much from what you've seen as an assistant? No, it, and it won't change too much, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I mean, what, what I would sit there at the moment and it says like, I think there's, with, there's probably our competitors are hoping we do change a little bit in terms of, you know, from, from where we've been in the last few years. So what it's about, it's about building up on the great things that we've done over the last few years. But if we can find a little couple of improvements, we've got to have our, our eyes open to, for those opportunities. I think you know, you're, at, you're at your most vulnerable when you're at your most successful, and that's when complacency can, can quite easily set in. So first and foremost for me, it's, it's ensuring that complacency doesn't, doesn't uh, come to the fore. And one way of doing that is having your eyes up for areas of improvement. Yeah, and, yeah sometimes um, improvement you know, you have to be moving forwards sometimes. It, yeah. Sometimes standing still is is going backwards, isn't it? Everyone well, else around you is trying so hard yeah. to be better. I always remember Nick Fozard, Nick Fozard in training, you know, a real character would be, say, you know, when Daniel Anderson was going, we'd be training so hard. And he'd just go, lads, relax, we're the champions. Let them catch <laughs> us. And they did. Yeah, but that's, did that is the I, risk, isn't it? I often think, like, and I look back from, from a playing experience, and I think we did probably, as a playing group, did Mick Potter a disservice in 2009 when he took over because Daniel was the coach, Daniel Anderson was the coach and we've been so successful doing it a certain way, mm. is that we become so attached to this way. It yeah. was like, and then Mick came in with a few of his own ideas and was like, it was almost like a reluctance, and all, but we don't do it like this. We've won doing it this way. And if I, if I had one regret when I look back over my career is that we should have supported him more as a playing group in terms of, right, okay, then how can we come about helping you? Because as, as we know now, and you get mature <laughs> and wiser, there's more than one way of winning a rugby league. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and periods of dominance can end, can't they? I mean, you see, I know you're a massive City fan, and like you see yeah. just with, with what's happened with Liverpool recently, and obviously even City, and fellow yeah. City fan here, and all yeah. sorts of critics coming Pep Guardiola's way. But, you know, styles change and things evolve, don't they? Yeah. Even, even without, you know, you, you look that way for two minutes and it can happen from behind. Yeah. Well, it's generational teams change the way how the game's played. Now, Saints over the last maybe four or five years have changed how the game is played in this mm. country and teams that will adapt and will, will, will work out ways to beat St. Helens. The big challenge for Paul and, and St. Helens is, is to keep moving forward enough to keep them at bay. Mm. Because just staying where you are is not going to cut it for Saints for a, for a period. They might be good enough this year, maybe next year, but somebody will get them if mm. they stand still. So I think in sport, progressions everything it's never huge changes that are needed it's only i think you know you're clutching at straws when you think we've got to completely rewrite everything and i think that's the temptation when things aren't going well mm. i think what justin holbrook said's genius isn't it the answers are always right there you just want yeah. to look away to find them yeah, yeah. rather than just acknowledging everything that's around you but you've got to and this is where like everyone's obsessed with sport being really interested in what sport has to teach people the only thing that i think really sometimes business and I think other walks of life can take is constant feedback and improvement and mm. developing, mm. pushing, you know, getting better, which is the essence of, 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 of elite sport. Yeah. And that's, that's, the, that's the challenge for Paul and the challenge for St. Helens is, you know, what, after what's been almost a perfect few years, well, it's like, you know, to, to improve on that. And that's... Are, are British coaches, do you think, getting more respect now than ever? And certainly in the, in the last couple of decades, when you look at, John's friend, Mark Applegarth at, at Wakefield. <laughs> um, yeah, we, the less said about that, the better, isn't it? Um, no, I've spoken to Mark about that. Yeah, it, no, no, it's, yeah. it's true. It, it was more well, the apology, though, the forced apology. No, yeah, it was a bit cringy. It's not, it was a, a confirmation statement. This <laughs> guy called it. Uh, that's what he called it. It was a clarification Confident. statement. A clarification and you, and statement. you stand by that statement 100%. Yeah, well, no, because Mark yeah, Applegarth no, has no experience. I don't know anything about him as a coach. You do I'll, now, though. You've done loads of work research. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I'm going, I've been and watched Wakefield train. So, <laughs> was that uh, your choice or Sky's? No, I rang the guy yeah. straight up. I'm like, Fair play. mate, are you offended? Because I wasn't offended at all. It was no quite experience. funny. I've been asked to Was comment. the apology statement, sorry, the, was it confirmation <laughs> statement? Was that, clarification statement. Was that filmed on an iPhone? 
I think it was on it was Nokia on Samsung 32. clamshell. 32, yeah, yeah. 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 What they didn't send the crew, the full <laughs> sky crew down there for that one. Anyway, the, the, the well, route, put, put it this way, if he slags me off, he won't ring me up and apologize. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> hey, <laughs> well that's the thing. If people ask me about Paul Wellens as a coach, right? If I get asked to speak about him, I can with hand on heart tell you that I understand how Paul works. Mm. I understand what he's about, what his coaching style is like. I understand what his philosophies are. I understand how he approaches his work. So it's easy for me to talk about Paul for somebody else, younger coaches who I don't know. Mm. It's wrong to talk about them because I don't know. Yeah. And for Mark yeah. Applegath and young English coaches who you don't know, it's positive. It's an unbelievable thing, I think, for the game that we are giving James Ford, Mark Applegath chances to coach at the top yeah. level. Well, Matt, Matt not, Pete and obviously and people... Yeah, it's, it's not my job or your job or anybody's job we broadcast mm. to inflate the, the sense of where they're at in their career with no knowledge. No. That's irresponsible. Okay, we'll take Mark out of the equation, but obviously with what Ian Watson's done over the last few years and Mark knows him very, very well, yeah. you know, Matt Pete in his first season... What I'm trying to get to is that it's good, isn't it? This is a good place for British coaches, business, right? Yeah. And for you to be going in as a head coach this time. Obviously, it's all dependent on what you do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Ever you look at Paul Rowley as well at Salford, who's got got Salford in one game of a grand final. So, you know, you've mentioned Mark Applegarth, Lee Radford still, in the Lee company. Radford still doing it. You know, even Steve McNamara in, in Catalan, although he's coaching the French side, he's a, mm. a British coach. So we're getting more and more British coaches with you know, coaching as head coaches in in, in in the top flight is is great. That's not to say that the the Aussie influence isn't welcome at times, and yeah, yeah. and and both Tony Smith and Rowan Smith, are, are obviously Willie Peters knew it. Uh, uh, Rovers, Cass, for example, Sorry. at Rovers. Yeah, at Rovers. Yeah, so you know they're co great coaches. You know, whichever side of the world they're from, we're always welcome in this competition. But it's certainly great for for Super League. I feel that that we're having more and more mm. British coaches getting opportunities. Uh, Parlez-vous français? Oh yeah, uh, Laurent. Yep. Laurent. Yeah, we. Oui. We. So Laurent Fresino. Yeah. He yeah. looks like a really hairy man. Is he really hairy? Uh, he's got a lot of like. He's got one of those permanent beards. He's got facial hair. Yeah, yeah. he's got very, facial yeah. hair. Maybe it's, he's, got, he's from round France and that. Sure it's Maybe it's like a beard. Beard stubble. transplant. You know where was that? When Somebody shaves and, and they've <laughs> just got stubble immediately again. Maybe a beard transplant. You know, Con um, Connor Ben and Chris Eubank Jr. both had beard transplants. What's a beard transplant? Little, little patchy bits of stubble, and then they thought I'd so that that he had a beard, beard transplant. Yeah. What, where did beard you get that transplant? Done? Turkey. Turkey, I assume, yeah. <laughs> but how, how important is that to have the trusted lieutenants? Because you've been one of those. Yeah. You've got to choose those the right people, right, for that. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, obviously, having Lauren on board, obviously, me and Lauren didn't have a, a relationship before him coming on board, but I did meet him a few times before before he came to the club. And you know, one of the first things I sent for him, he's got a huge passion for rugby league. Like, Did you choose him, though? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't yeah. someone who's, you're going to work it's with. It's not him. an obvious choice. No, no, I'll say not, that. No, is it? It's not. Well, look. One thing. Uh, there was a few things that, to consider when I was looking for an assistant coach. One, I wanted someone who's had a coach experience before, considering I haven't. So I think that you know that was a that was something that I wanted someone who you know. And, and Lauren coached at Catalan. He had some success there, but obviously he didn't finish that that great for him. Uh, so he's, he's experienced the rough and the smooth, so, so to speak. So having that experience alongside me, I think, is invaluable. Uh, the, other, the other one was a, a fresh pair of eyes, you know, someone who's had very little connection mm -hmm. with the club in the past. So, you know, I talk about you know looking for those small areas of improvements. Maybe it's in a fresh pair of eyes, not someone yeah. who actually knows yeah. how the club's you know, operated in the past. So, you know, ha having him come in and have a fresh pair of eyes and be open to us trying different things where he feels we can improve, I think is important as well. Uh, and obviously the final one, he's just got to be a great bloke and he is, he's fantastic. Do you ever have any of those sort of anxiety dreams slash nightmares where it all goes tits up and Lauren just takes your job by Christmas? No, no, not really. No. <laughs> no. What sort? Does what it give you much uh, dreams? Much um, having, well, an no? anxiety dream? Yeah. What yeah. do you I mean? Used to, I, used to, I used to have loads of them at, uh, be about being on air as a presenter oh, that right. went on and that, everything was an absolute disgrace shambles messed the whole thing up and you'd wake up sweating in the middle of the night <laughs> <laughs> that's such a Seriously, horrible yeah. thing yeah, honestly anxiety dream <laughs> you never, not Google it. Yeah. an anxiety dream yeah you never had one I don't think so no, no. no. Um, World Club Challenge yeah so Penrith Panthers how big an opportunity is that to kick off the Wellings chapter that's oh, huge. Yeah, it's a it's, it's a huge opportunity, and, and obviously you, you you refer to it there as the wellness chapter. I don't quite see it in in, in, in that same sense. It's it's it, it's a chapter in 
you know, this team's kind of evolution and where, where they've come from, really. And you know, they, it's an opportunity that they've earned, but not just off the back of winning the Super League title last year. I think off what they've achieved over the last three or four years. Obviously, due to COVID and different things like that, we missed out on playing in a couple of World Cup challenges. Uh, and obviously, it's a it's a different experience going down under and taking on Penrith Panthers. You know, the two-time uh, premiers over there in their own backyard. It's it's a, it's as big as it uh, as it gets. But you know, one thing you know, I know, I know that people uh, will class us as the underdogs, and and, and probably rightfully so. And, and a lot, a lot of uh, people will, will write us off, particularly down under. But you know, we we know we're a good side. We know that we can go there and we know we're going to have to play well, but it's a it's a huge opportunity for us as a club to go and uh, show people down under what we're about as a club, but also you know, represent the, the British Rugby League and, and, and the Super League competition in the, in, in the, in the right fashion as well. I think this, this, this will be the best World Cup challenge I, I can ever remember because you've got Saints on the one hand who've won four on the bounce, mm. the most successful team of the Super League era, and then Penrith have won the last two comps and then they were in the grand final that year before that, aren't they? So arguably they've been the best Australian team for the last 20, 30 years as well. Mm. So I think it's going to be an amazing game and what a first match to, to kind of be in charge of, isn't it? It yeah. always feels like a weird time to have it though, that, that point of the season, isn't it? Because you just said that should be the, the culmination of the season, the best against the best from, from that particular season, isn't it? And it, it almost discredits the, the quality of those two teams to have it as like a pre-season friendly. I know it's not. Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. It's always been there's always been discussions around what you know if and when it should be played and things like that. But obviously, you know, for, for years now it's been done at the kind of either the end of January, early February type time time of year. So, uh, you know, Penrith, for example, like Api Corisau and Viliamu Kikau, who were instrumental in the in the grand final winning team, they've moved on. Uh, mm -hmm. So the players are actually. I've made the effort to get them there, don't actually get the opportunity to play. That's not after. right, is it? Doesn't it, seem. Doesn't it, it's a, it's a little strange, but we we had the same. If you remember back in two thousand and seven when we played Brisbane, is that you know Jamie Lyon was in the grand final team that that got us there, yeah. and Matt Gidley played centre in the in the World Cup challenge against Brisbane. So yeah. mm. not a bad replacement. Though. Not a bad replacement. Where does it sit for you guys? I mean, you you played in two, didn't you? In oh uh, one and oh seven. Oh, so one two and I won in oh seven. Yeah, yeah. lost two. I think you were in the oh seven winning team. Seven, yeah. What you know as, as a player. Where 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 is it in terms of the priorities? Well, I I always viewed it as a as a way of look. I didn't I never had any real deep desire to go and play in the NRL when I was a player, and uh, there might have been an opportunity around when I was twenty four, twenty five to to maybe go and do that. But I was happy playing at St Helens, playing in a great team with a lot of people. I didn't just class as teammates, we were class as friends as well. So I didn't mm. want to be anywhere else. So that was kind of my opportunity as an English player to actually say, you know what, I can compete at that level because there's always this this discussion around could could they have made it in the NRL? And the question winds me up to be honest because if you if you're playing international rugby league and you know you pl you're playing in, in Super League at the highest level consistently year on year, then there's no doubt you could have played in in the NRL. You know, as Mark went over there and proved he, he went and played in the NRL, it was something that he wanted to do. So So you almost had more of a point to prove in those games because of that question, right? I think so. And the fact that we you know we played against a Brisbane side full of like basically chocked up with mm. uh, Queensland uh, uh, states of origin players and, and Australian internationals and we beat them is proof that yeah we could have and comfortably gone and played in the NRL. I think Mark made a good point about this one though because I feel it's different. Oh. Yeah. Because I feel like the NRL and Australia just view Super League realistically is there's not... They look down the noses massively. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I just feel if Saints can get it right they, mm. could, they could easily mm. roll Penrith mm. if they get it right. Mm. And, and I think that would be I, I felt like the World Cup was a chance for England to do something similar. That's why I was really disappointed when England went out in the semi-final because I just felt like they'd ha had the opportunity to really lay a marker down yeah. and they couldn't get it done. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is the chance for St Helens to go over there and stick one on pen. be a hell of a statement, wouldn't it? What an opportunity, one, to bring everyone, not that they need to be closer together, but in your early tenure as head coach... Yeah, to go and get a result there. It's, only, it's, it's I don't know. It's all, it's almost all downhill from there, isn't it? Because you set. It's dangerous in sport, isn't it? When you set standards, when you set a bar somewhere, yeah. 
the expectation. You could fans resign is, straight is away, and then you've just like <laughs> you just you've won rugby league. <laughs> you've completed it. Well, I think you use the word there. Well, I just keep it an opportunity. I yeah, think it's, it's a great opportunity for us, and uh, and, I, and I've actually spoke to the players openly around around how we approach this because. Uh, there's a misconception that we get ourselves up for one game mm. and then we forget that actually we've got to come back and play a Super League season. So we lo- we lo- got beat by Wakefield the week after we beat yeah, Brisbane, so, didn't we? So, so the, the, <laughs> you know, the players need to Wakefield understand again. that our pre-season hasn't been around going beating Penrith. Our pre-season has been around putting ourselves in a position to, to, to go and defend our Super League crown. But round one's different this year for us. Round one's Penrith away. Last mm. year it was Catalan at home. So we're approaching it in a different fashion. We, we understand the enormity of the game. We understand the opportunity that, that lies in front of us. Uh, and we, you know, we want to go down under and give it our all. But we are also mindful of the, that that's not where it ends. And what an experience for the lads. Like some of the young lads who probably come into the squad might, have, you know, might not be playing or in, on the bench or whatever. To go and experience playing in Western Sydney in a massive crowd at a massive occasion. That's something you remember for the rest of your life, won't you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, Saints took a team down under in 97 when they tried the old World Club Challenge series. Yeah, yeah. And then before then, it was 76 when I think they took a team to play, play the Roosters. So it happened in 76, it happened in 97. Now it's again happening in 2023, which shows it doesn't happen often. So this, this group are really fortunate and privileged to be in a position to mm-hmm. go and pull on a Saints jersey uh, down under. You know, and represent you know a small town in the north of England, in in one of the major cities in the world, and you know that, that's incredible for them. And and Weller, you're writing history. You as a club, St Helens, as every season goes by. I mean, going for an unprecedented five on the trot is just in, incredible. That comes obviously with its with its challenges as well. Um, does a successful season only end with you lifting this trophy that's next to us? In my eyes, at this moment in time, yeah. I mean, people. People uh, say, keep asking me the question, can you win five? And I say to them, well, I lost five. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's the reality of the situation. Yeah. I went and lost five times consecutive at Old Trafford. Greedy so, Paul so, just trying to make it up, trying to get his, yeah. all his rings back. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so why, why can't you win it five times? Yeah, it, 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 it's certainly possible. And uh, you know, I'm really fortunate that I get to you know, work with a group of players who understand, for my first coaching job, who understand what winning looks like. Mm. Uh, I think, you know, you guys can back me up this this be, being part of a team that got, gets used to winning is is quite powerful and on the flip side and you're part of the team that get used to losing it, it can work the other oh, way yeah. uh, you know the group that i have at the moment understand what performing in big games looks like uh, so you know that's one of the main reasons i'm excited to work with him and what i'm really interested in here is this dynamic because mark you don't do much tv these days but you still could come i'm open to offers oh, well, you, you're gonna say if i have to Chris, well um, but you, you're trying to do some bits in the championship you know you listen yeah, yeah. You amateur, down a league, wouldn't you? amateur rugby league you drop down a league and we were talking to you earlier on the way here about how we could yeah. work on making you no you said that but well, well, we can make you work on telly a bit, a bit more yeah, again, you know, said something that. to think about we'll, we'll get you on telly as well, well that'll be good yeah, ironically I'm, I'm back seeing, seeing as it's your I'm job <laughs> so I'm back seeing as it's your job I'm back <laughs> no so you know where this is going but yeah, yeah. because like, you're quite happy John to, to go on on live national television I'm and, and um, destroy the, the, the Lee Leopards and Derek Beaumont and, I, haven't, um, I haven't ever done that carry on well, did, did Derek Bowman come for you? With the Centurions, yeah. wasn't it? So he came for you un- completely out of the blue? No, he just thought... He, he like thought a leopard was, from the... He thought I was being rude by suggesting Saints okay. would beat Lee. Right, yeah, yeah. Lee, anyway, well, Centurions. That's so last season, forget yeah, it. Yeah, it is. Two um, years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But are you going to be able to stick the knife into your friend here? I've got a responsibility, to be honest. Oh, haven't I? It's my job. Back, no, it's my job. It's my job. And, you look and so disappointed, Paul, when he said that. No, he didn't, because he knows. I'll be honest. <laughs> As well as, as well as... You were his best man, or, or vice versa. But I'm, I, yeah, the, it's just not, it, it's my job, I'll be honest. That's all I can be. I can't be honest about some things and then choose not to be honest about other things on TV. Because mm. that's disingenuous, isn't it? It's just not, not, like, okay. and I've got, a, I care and... To be I honest, care. I've been disregarding Wilco's opinion exactly. for a long, long time. <laughs> a long time. All right, John, John, be honest, who does uh, Paul Wellens look like? No, two, two ringers. Two ringers, go on. Yeah. Tom Hanks' son, Colin Hanks. Right, for people who want to just have a pleasing two minutes, Google Colin Hanks and then split your screen like Will does on his iPad. How did you do that? That was amazing. Yeah, iPad Pro. And then get it's Paul Wellens up. Colin Hanks, Paul Wellens. The other one, which is a I've dead I've got ring. two, actually. Go on, you go. Uh, you've, you've seen the film Jimmy Grimble? 
No. He looks yes. like a young Paul Wellman. We've been saw that before. Great yeah. city film, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But outside main But then go on, John, your, your favourite Jimmy one. Nail. Jimmy, Jimmy Nail. Do you remember? <laughs> I'll feed his own pet. Jimmy Nail. <laughs> it's look at him. <laughs> He's there. flaring his nostrils. Well, on, yeah. on the best man stuff, did you did you return the favours? Were you both best men? No, no. No, uh, no I was his. It was just a one-way street. Did you have your brothers for you? Yeah, my brother, yeah. Mm. Safe choice. Yeah. Yeah. Which wedding, John, was that? One or... <laughs> Do you ever get confused for anybody, Will? Do you Ian, ever get lookalikes? Uh, Paul's Jimmy Gr- what's Jimmy Grimble, did you say? Yeah, Kirk from Coronation Street. I get oh, Dean Gaffney. Come on. <laughs> come on, <laughs> um, look, wrapping up in a, in a serious way, um, you've got a two-year contract, Paul, yeah. which, if I know anything about you from the last hour and a half, you want to stay a lot longer than two years, right? Yeah. So what does Paul Wellens have to do to be St. Helens coach in 2025? win that's it dead simple mm-hmm. uh, and I know you, you said uh, obviously before you referenced uh, Christian and Justin and, and they've won and gone on to bigger and better things mm. but for me there is no bigger and better things I'm exactly where I want to be um, at the club uh, you know, I've got more than just a connection with and uh, but I know there's a huge responsibility there and when you coach a club like St Helens it's about winning uh, and it doesn't fill me with any fear or trepidation or anything like that. That's just the cold, hard reality of the situation. Mm-hmm. It was the same for me as a player. Uh, obviously, when you don't win as a player, the book doesn't stop with you. Now it does uh, as a head coach. I, I'm, and I'm so comfortable with that. Uh, I couldn't tell you. Obviously, uh, you know, the games have got to get going yet. Different pressures and different situations are going to come my way. So you know, I don't, I don't sit here like pontificating about what being a head coach is all about because the reality is I don't know anything about it yet. Mm. I'm, I'm soon to find out, but I feel like I'm in a good spot with a, with a great team. Uh, uh, and, you know, if we all work hard uh, together, we can achieve something special. I'm confident of that. Do you see yourself as a Sir Alex Ferguson under in 20 years, head coach? I wouldn't look to that, that too far down the track at the moment. So, so it's, you mentioned Pep Guardiola before, Will. It's like a, I did a, an interview the other week with a with a report and they asked me about Man City and going mm. watching it and what do you like about it and things like this and then there was a headline written saying Paul wants to challenge, channel his inner pep and I was like oh my god that's so <laughs> cringy it's so like so awful like to read that about yourself because I'd never actually said anything along them lines at all it's like I'm comparing myself to Pep Guardiola when I'm not even you were you were not even close typical in my life just classic, typical you, know, you know what I mean so exactly what he is that's part of again being a head coach is that things will get written things will get said your, mm. your words May get taken well that's what I said to you earlier that's what happens isn't it and then you having to stay patient with that and then look that reporter in the face when he comes to your press conference every week and staying calm and who was that. it that's who was the diff- reporter different challenge oh, okay. I can't remember now to be honest but, but like it was a, insignificant no, it was, is it it was a nice easy nice interview but the headlines are quite often yeah. not actually what not the report it would have been report. some big cheese in a tower yeah, who's yeah, gone so, let's make it a sexy yeah, again it was a learning curve for me to say actually you've got to be careful what you are mm. talking about are, are you ready to look dishevelled because you look mint right now you know you look young you look fresh much, you look yeah. tasty but are you ready it's like prime ministers when they go and oh, look at the yeah. state of Tony yeah, we've Blair seen him dishevelled yeah, yeah, I've seen you dishevelled many a time is it I think, I think the coaching game might just, just do that to, to me itself mm. won't it so have you dyed your hair no you sound like Mike Rush now no. You've dyed your hair. I haven't dyed. Yes, hair. you have dyed your hair. I haven't dyed my hair. I have a flush. Have you got grey bits on the sides? No comment. I've got grey bits on the sides. Oh, right. <laughs> it's the yeah, light. Yes, yes. It's just the lighting. And they're about to get grey, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, look. And by the way, one thing I picked up from Wilco, he, he, he drops a few little bombs here and there, and he did say, Mark, I don't know if you noticed it earlier. He sort of said, you know, I've, I've never got, gone down the coaching route myself because I've, I've put myself in that position. As in, like, he didn't rule that out that he might be going into coaching one no, day. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, even the idea of it's not a Wellings cushy number and, and, and Wilkin together, it's like, it sounds like an estate agent God, or something, mm-hmm. doesn't it? Or a solicitor's. It's just not even worth considering. No? Yeah. Good cop, bad cop, or two bad cops. I don't know <laughs> I don't what know. kind of, yeah. What do, and just finally, before, just before I throw some quick fires at you to finish, what, why... Paul, are you considered a St. Helens legend when you were there for 15 years and, you know, you won a hell of a lot of trophies. <laughs> you were there 18 years <laughs> and, and they hate you. No, I don't think they do. A lot of them do, don't they? I don't some think so. Some well. of them? No, I no, think they're so, like quite the... fond of him, yeah. yeah. Oh, is it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry, I thought I got completely wrong impression from all the ones I spoke to. Um, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> all the ones, ones who like to speak to you. <laughs> in that bar when I was in St. Helens giving away a Ben Flower. Ben Flower shirt. Ben well, Flower well, signed Wrong crowd, well, wrong yeah, crowd. Yeah, someone right. bought it. I'm surprised someone in St. Helens wanted a Ben Flower shirt. <laughs> That's what I mean. <laughs> someone bought, Mark was in there breaking up the fight. First one in 2014, he was straight to the front. Or straight to the front. Lance, you touched yeah. Lance like that. 
do it. No, you were straight in. I was in first, yeah. Big man yeah. here, yeah? Yeah, well, that doesn't surprise that. me. Really. That's what um, leaders do. <laughs> right, some quick fire ones to finish. Um, Super League winners, John and Mark. I can't put Paul on the spot with this one. Super League winners 2023. Ooh, Saints, because my friend sat there. Mm. Saints. Yeah. Come mm. on, quick fire, but you can give me a reason. Um, j- just they've set the standard. Uh, and if, if look, 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 for me, we spoke about a lot of things prep, planning, detail, execution, you know, work ethic. There's a lot of luck comes into it in, in terms of, you know, injuries, things that are outside of your control. And often that defines the season. I thought when Lewis Dodd got injured and there was a few things happening, I thought that was a real tricky time. You just never know. So if Saints have the fair share of luck mm. and they work as hard as they do, I just can't see them getting beat. Mark, Sheep, you're going to say Saints as well? Well, they're the best team, aren't they? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, like I said, I, I doubted whether they'd do it last year when Lewis Dodd got injured. Al Wormsley, who's a massive player for them, got injured. They still won convincingly in the grand final, so Saints. Women's Super League winners. I noticed that Matty Smith has got the Saints job, old yeah. teammate of yours. Women's mm-hmm. Super League Bloody winners. Bloody smegs, mate. Yeah. <laughs> Saints, are they, are they, are they up there, right up there as contenders yeah. this year? Of course they are, yeah. yeah. Women, Double uh, well, Saints. Saints. No, nah, maybe. I fancy Leeds, Leeds. Leeds and York. They're signed Hardcastle, yeah. aren't they? Good play. Yeah, Leeds, Leeds, York, Saints. It's a coin toss between those three. Give Leeds. me a name. Leeds, you're going for Leeds, Mark. Um, Challenge Cup winners, John? I'm going to go Warrington. I just got to feel like they need to win some of this year, or they're in trouble. So, I think Huddersfield. Huddersfield they've signed well. I think they'll go on to another level this year. The surprise package, John Wilkin of twenty-three. The Lee Leopards. <laughs> hey, it's a tongue twister, that. Don't, Lee Leopards. Don't. No, they have. They've, I think they've recruited well. And do you know what? They've really. If you want to be impressed, watch how much they've invested in the first game. Mm. The production yeah, of the first game. We've got scouting for girls playing. Yeah, I mean, they've, they've gone like flamethrowers. They've got the same people who produced the grand final match day experience doing the game at mm-hmm. Lee. Like, fair play to them. Mm. Like, if you're going to do it, go big. And they've signed well. Yeah. They've signed well. Ricky Latelli, for me, was one of the standout players in Super League. He's at, he's at Lee. I mean, for a team coming up, I think they've signed. Apparently, yeah. is it the masked, masked singer that they have like, on ITV? That, yeah. The masked Davina singer. Davina McCall, that show, singer. yeah. yeah. They've got the same people doing the mascot for the the new leopard the mask that did that. <laughs> the mask, sing, yeah. mask. Mask, mask flanning. <laughs> yeah, I can ask you that one, Paul. Surprise package, go on for this year because I know you've done your done your prep, done your homework. Who, who do you think is going to spring the biggest surprise? I, well, I, I I don't know, but I, I agree with John in terms of I think Lee coming up. You know, you know, quite quite often in Super League, the team that comes up generally generally yeah. generally struggle. But I think you know the, the you know, I think Derek uh, Beaumont there at Lee and, and the people involved have have probably learned from past experiences in terms of how they handled coming up uh, uh, last time and they seem to have like like John said recruited really well so you know they're going to be a very very tough team to beat this mm. year. Forget the Mars Singer as well. We we still is, how is that charity fight going for between Beaumont and Wilkin? We could, that could be a I great think it fizzled out time, couldn't it? Fizzled out. Great. <laughs> John didn't fancy it. Um, let's last three. Uh, Matt, I, John, uh, sorry, Hull, sorry, Mark. Yeah, I'm on the podcast. Sorry, well. I forgot you were here. Uh, I think Hull FC will be much improved under Tony Smith. Yeah. Hull KL fans are really looking forward to Hull oh, FC's oh, new coach. Um, give me a man of steel. Bloody Jack Wellsby. Wellsby. Mm, well, let's just say it can't be a Saints player. Who would the man of steel be? Uh, oh, wow. Well, I think given, you know, what he did last year, uh, the way he finished the season, I think Bevan French would be not too far Bevan, away. yeah. And George Williams. George Williams. He was outstanding in the World Cup and if his pack play better than they did last year, I think he'll have a big season. Breakout star, John. Breakout star. Mm. Good question. No? Great question. Anyone give me a breakout star? Josh Thewlis, f- w- fullback at Warrington. He's already broken out, hasn't he? Can no, he, he played a bit more on the wing. Can you give us anyone to say? So you want to do that for a youngster? Is there someone that's yeah, yeah, find it out to, to difficult to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and finally, your rugby league wish for 2023 is on the spot, Mark. This is you're not used to questions on the spot. Mark, you want to go first? Rugby league, your rugby league wish. John Wilkins say more controversial things. <laughs> World <laughs> peace. Can that happen? World peace. Well, World enjoy peace. It. Yeah. Yeah, you, I mean, you oh, like, my, you, my friend Paul's won some silverware. Yeah, that's a nice one. That's a nice one. I, I think for everybody just well. to get along. Nah, we don't nice, want that. Wouldn't it? You'd want that, do you? You like stirring the pot. You're the Roy Keane of I rugby league. I'm not at all. You keep saying these things, but I'm not. It's different. Can you grow a moustache like Roy Keane? Has he got a moustache? Yeah, yeah. he's got. He's got a Ted Lasso. Roy, must moustache you a question? Mm. 
Very good, Mark. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, well, lovely, done, mate. That Thank was you great so from you as well. What was that? What you've done? Well, that last hour and a half. It was great from hour and 46 minutes, by the way. Great you didn't, you from, didn't great make it all about you for a change. Well, you know, things have got to... People, some people want that. Some people want that really? back. But some people want Whippets <laughs> season one back. But, you know, oh, maybe we can do that in a basement somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Paul. Honestly, mate, wishing you the best this season. It's going to be really interesting. I, I'm going. I am actually going to watch a lot more <laughs> Thursday night. Genuinely, I am. You know, I just Thursday just night. because I want to see how Paul gets on. Mm. Um, but look, congratulations on firstly getting the job, and I know it's a dream for you to do it, and I hope it ends the way that you want it to. And um, we'll get you back on at some point if you come back and yeah, see definitely. us. Definitely. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much, mate. Yes. Right, give us a follow, everyone, on Twitter at Out of Your RL. We need you to review subscribe, download, wherever you get your podcast, whatever platform that is on. Otherwise, we can't keep doing the podcast and we get rubbish guests. But we can. Just be a bit not saying Paul's rubbish, I'm saying it. More, you said more rubbish Let's guests and went like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the big guests are going to keep on coming. I don't know who we got. Who we got next? Uh, can someone shout from the right? No, just, just someone did that in the background. Um, It'd be someone, wouldn't it? Yeah. We always end up with someone. <laughs> <laughs>